A very warm good morning to all of you. I Padma Chaube, Assistant Professor, Postgraduate Teaching Department of Law, Rashtra Santut Kodoji Maharaj Nagpur University. Extend a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of 108th Indian Science Congress and Rashtra Santut Kodoji Maharaj Nagpur University to the plenary session number 13 on implications of glycobiology in human health, disease, and cancer therapeutics. Before we proceed with this session, I would like to give few instructions to the participants. Kindly keep your cell phones on silent mode. Please be seated throughout this session. In case you have any queries regarding this session, it will be taken at the end of this session with the permission of the Honorable Chairperson. For this session, it is a matter of pride and privilege to have Honorable Dr. Professor B. P. Banerjee Sir as the Chairperson. Oh, sorry. Chatterjee, sir, I request Honorable Chairperson to kindly grace the dais. Now, I would like to introduce to you our est uh, today's esteemed Chairperson, Dr. Vishnu Pada Chatterjee, sir. Dr. Chatterjee, sir, distinguished honorary scientist, Chittaranjan National uh, Cancer Institute, Kolkata, NASI honorary scientist, adjunct professor, Yokohama City University, Yokohama, Japan, research advisor at MIT World Peace University, Pune, India, formerly senior professor, Department of Biological Chemistry, Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, Jadwapur, Kolkata, Emirates Professor, Department of Natural Sciences, West Bengal University of Technology, Salt Lake, Kolkata, Sir Asutosh Mukherjee Fellow, Indian Science Congress Association, Senior Scientist Platinum Jubilee Fellow, National Academy of Sciences India, Merits Fellow, All India Council of Technological, uh, Technical Education. Now I request Dr. Pal Thoreman to kindly welcome our today's chairperson with memento as a token of appreciation and gratitude. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Now, I would request the chairperson to kindly proceed with this session. Also, I would like to mention, considering the paucity of time, each speaker will get 15 minutes. Over to you, sir. So, hall is very small, so I don't need the... Very good morning today, misty morning. So I would say that it is our pleasure that this 108 Indian Science Congress now holding this plenary session. Yes, sir, Hello. Because within few minutes all the students will join the so we coming on the way. On the way. Yeah. So what I would say. So you will start, sir. You start, they will be joining. Yeah. And Today the theme is Hello. Hello. Today theme is that implication of glycobiology in human health, disease and cancer therapeutics. We have three foreign speakers. One is Professor uh, Yashuhiro Uzeki from Yokohama City University. Dr. Hafiz Ahmed from University of Maryland, Baltimore, USA. Professor Deepak Banerjee from Kokoriko Department of Biochemistry. And I would, I am also a speaker, but I would speak at last. First, I invite uh, Professor Yat, uh, Yasuhiro Ozeki. Uh, Professor Ozeki in the University of University, 
and uh, and his his field is a lactin glycobiology, and he will speak on the recent advances in lactins from basic applications. Because time is short, I don't want to uh, say more words. Just in Russian, so I invite Professor Uzeki to come to the diet and start his lecture. Okay. So, Professor Uzeki, please come. The speaker will be given 20 minutes and two, two minutes ex, two minutes extra that is 88 and two minutes for question only one question is allowed if there is any question please join hamala lisa chike bale mai boruneka mao kapakoru mai bohoto kushufu Good morning, everybody. I'm Yasuhiro Ozeki from Yokohama, Japan. My topic is recent advances in lectins from basics to applications. Lectins are representative carbohydrate binding proteins. They are weak and reversible interaction with glycans, exquisitory controls several cellular functions. Day by day, our understanding of the importance of glycans and their relationships to lifestyle diseases, cancers, infection, and regeneration is increasing. I want to say that lectins are essential partners of glycans for functioning where I can mediate the living systems in this lecture. Unilectin is a structured database on lectins, established by a French glycobiologist, <coughs> Professor An Inverti, in 2020. By browsing the database, she found three standard properties on lectin structures. Many of them have tandem repeat cyclic symmetry in the polypeptide and were comprised of multimeric subunits. These features help us understand how lectin evolved and may aid in developing lectin drug designs. These graphs show what organisms have lectins and what sugar is preferred to be recognized by lectins. Animal lectins represent 17% of the total and 25% of lectins bind to galactose. The unilectin database classifies the lectins into 28 protein fold consisting of 100 types of lectin primary structure families. On the other hand, over 90% of known animal species in modern oceans belong to only 30 invertebrate phyla. Genes of current marine invertebrates are considered to reflect those of a common ancestor in the Paleolithic era from the Cambrian to the Permian period. Comparing the structures of hundreds marine invertebrate lectins, they are classified into almost all of these 28 protein fold. Hence, marine invertebrates are curious but excellent resources for lectin study. Galactose were preferred to be recognized by many lectins 
Besides, the same as in India, Japan is a maritime country, and my place, Yokohama, is a representative maritime city in Japan. We purified many kinds of marine vertebrates living in Sagami Bay near Tokyo and Yokohama, which is famous for its high animal biodiversity. We tried to purify galactose binding lectins from them. They are homogenized, extracted, and applied to galactose immobilized clams, although the purification steps were the same. The molecular masses of each lectin were different in different animals. From our collections, I introduced uh, the novel properties of beta trifold lectins, civil and mighty lec, purified from muscles. I want to provide today's topic about beta trifold lectins in muscles for you who are big fans of South Indian cuisine, Kalmakaya Kaduka Ulatiyatu. The bival mussels are classified into the family Michiridae, Phyla mollusca. By the way, this menu is already being available to enjoy in Japan and waiting for you. This is a uh, distribution of protein fold on lectins. Many of them consist of beta seeds. The beta trifoil is the second largest group found first in the rice toxin, following the first largest group of conconobarine A. The alpha beta mixed and beta sandwich con containing C type lectin and galactin follow them. They were shared within the biological domains of bacteria, archaea, eukaryote, and viruses. 75% of the total lectin discovered so far were of eukaryotic origin. On the other hand, beta trifold lectin has, was characteristic because 70% of the total were of bacteria origin. Even though the rice in bee chain are plant beta trifold lectin from castor beans originated from prokaryotes, The evidence may be revealed by bioinformatics in the near future. Overall, the origins of beta trifold lectin seems to be derived from the ancestors of life. They spread widely beyond domains and kingdoms. This spreading may be due to the ho horizontal transmission of the lectin gene carried by microorganisms and viruses. The, spread, the spreading may be due to the horizontal transmission of the lectin gene carried, carried by microorganisms and the viruses, though their uh, infection, parasitism, prediction, uh, symbiosis, and so. In the last year, a standard textbook, Essential Soul Food Glycobiology, has been updated as a fourth edition. All of the chapters are available to read for free from PubMed. As a co-author of chapter 31 on the R-type lectins, I added to the figure to the chapter. In the new chapters, introduce the detail of beta trifold lectins from bacteria, fungi, animals, and plants. Besides. Besides another interpretation, uh, 
has been added that beta trifold is a fundamental fold of proteins that evolved convergently into lectins, toxins, enzymes, and growth factors and protease inhibitors. Metilus galloplobin cells is a standard edible muscle that originated in the Mediterranean Sea, and Metilusefta virgata lives in the Asian area in the Sea of Japan. They are classified as different subfamilies, though their morphology looks quite similar. Distinct galactose binding lectins of 17 and 15 kilodalton were purified from each subfamily collecting in Yokohama and Nagasaki. To avoid boring this animation uh, that is architecting the structure of muscles, beta trifold lectin cell, I covered it with a famous song, uh, All is Well. It is a metaphor for the trifold that three leaves of beta seeds makes a fold like uh, uh, three idiots in the movie collaborate together. Okay, no problem. Hmm, thank you. Okay. Sevil has three tandem repeats consisting of 129 amino acid in the polypeptide and uh, try have, uh, they have 12 beta seeds. Four beta seeds make each subdomain, alpha, beta, and gamma. Three subdomain make a subunit. A subunit consists of a barrel and a lid. The bottom of the lid looks like a symmetrical three clover leaf. The yellow amino acid in the alpha subdomain act for binding glycans. Two subunits consist of a dimer through two blue amino acids. The dimer capture cells with the binding to two glycans. Hence, several consist uh, forward all three properties uh, found by the Unilectin database. The structures of muscle lectin revealed, ex revealed exciting features. The primary structure of each lectin were different, except for having three tandem repeats. Nevertheless, the 3D structures of Sevil and Mighty Lek converge into a beta trifold fold. Sevil picked up a tricyclide like a clip at the first subdomain. On the other hand, Mighty Lek captured alpha galactose into the pocket of each subdomain. Both lectin consist of a dimer of each subunit bound non-covalently. The dimerization was essential for agglutinating cells and inducing signal transductions. One of my goal is to find out why muscle health plural kinds of beta trifold lectins uh, de derived from different primary structure families. We have elucidated that these lectins act as a cell regulating factor for lymphoma cells to activate the MAP kinase cascade, inducing apoptosis. He is not an athlete, but a lectin scientist who has the most robust black belt in karate. Do not miss his lecture, where Dr. Yuki Fuji will speak on the lectin-mediated signaling of cellular regulation in the section New Biology. Today, 
today in the afternoon. However, he will not appear wearing this uniform. Both lectins share the same beta trifold. Nevertheless, they are revealed to have very different glycan binding properties. Several recognized three types of glycans, GM1B, GA1, and SSEA4. Indeed, glycan are common trisaccharide structured gal beta 13 gal nac beta 14 gal is shared. On the other hand, Mytilek recognized GB3, GB4, and Forsman antigen having an alpha galactose. GM1B is a mimic of the glycan from Campylobacter bacteria that causes autoimmune neuropathy such as Guillain-Barre syndrome. GA1 and SSEA4 are biomarkers of natural killer and iPS cells. GB3 is the target glycan of barotoxin in O157 bacteria and is expressed explicitly on bracket lymphoma cells. GB4 has a property to bind to a toll like receptor, and the first man antigen is recognized heterophil antibodies. We will develop muscle lectins by combining them with advanced devices to apply for diagnostics to detect uh, the specific glycans causing diseases. Lastly, I discussed developing lectin microarray, innovating preventive medicine, and preserving marine bioresources. <coughs> lectin microarray is a profiling system of glycan structures by using a chip, immobilized 45 lectins, and an evanescent detector. Even in the US, uh, the, this system to evaluate the glycan structures of drug antibodies and erythropoietin for quality control. Visiting your access to MX website from the QR code, you will find a pile of the latest publications focusing on the lectin microarray in the world to find glycan, glycans causing good diseases. Recently, the lectin microarray system predicted the onset of IgA nephritis within, the fi within five years in diabetes patients. A drop of urine from the risk group has been detected to have specific glycan structures by a super high sensitive detector. Soon, uh, the India's population will be the largest in the world, including life expectancy will have a, a social problem that includes health care costs. If we can uh, predict minimally invasively the likelihood of diseases by lectins, we will prevent them and uh, reduce the costs. Based on MITELEC, we have created an artificial lectin, MITUVA1, by combining uh, computer simulation and biotechnology using bacteria instead of muscles. MITUVA1 has high thermal stabilities by com complete symmetry of the trifoil. The artificial lectin can bind to uh, Free, freely selected glycan structures. As symmetry study develops, the lineup of new artificial lectin on the tip will increase, and more diseases will be prevented. This, uh, this alternative uh, method by artificial lectin uh, also preserves the diversity of lectins in marine bioresources. 
Before ending my lecture, I want to express my gratitude to the ISCA, Indian Science Congress Association, Professor Vishnupada Chatterjee, and uh, the organized uh, committee for inviting me as a guest speaker for the plenary session. The year 2022 marked the 70th anniversary uh, of establishing diplomatic relationship between Japan and India. We hope uh, both countries will promote being closer uh, through science, technology, and education. In our study on marine invertebrate lectins, we are supported by both public and private research grant, such as JSPS, and had many collaborative supports from these organisms. During the decade, the research team has contributed to the uh, careers for uh, eight PhD students and invited many collaborators having different expertise, genders, and nationalities from Bangladesh, British, France, Italy, uh, Korea, and Japan. This is my conclusion. Accepting transforming society is essential to keep our economy and the Earth from this view. Making interactive and dialogic relationships without authority or favoritism for all gender gives us the uh, confidence to promote advanced Greek sciences. Creating a sustainable community needs the development of minimally invasive and alternative technologies, such as lectin microarray and artificial lectins. Combining glycobiology of other disciplines, such as AI and electro electronics, will invite a new age of glycomedicine for reducing healthcare cost. Lectins, essential glycan partners, have excellent potency to find presymptomatic status, and marine invertebrates are uh, variable resources of lectins to apply for new biology and new bio biotechnologies. Thank you for your kind attention to my lecture. Thank you, Professor Uzeki, for a very interesting uh, lecture on lectins and marine invertebrate lectin and artificial lectin, and uh, that is to finally to apply for the medicine in the medical field. So, only one question, please. We have one minute time. Any question? Can I ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, tell me more about what is the advantage of doing. Okay, uh, the natural lectin has a limitation to binding uh, glycan structures. But if we can combine the, uh, the AI or AI and the, the biotechnology, I hope to create the new more lectins which can bind any kinds of uh, glycans. Hmm. Thank you. Now I invite Dr. Hafiz Ahmed. Hafiz Ahmed is a, is a founder, president, and chief executive officer of Glycomontro, located at the Biotechnology Center of the University of Maryland, Baltimore, USA. So after receiving PhD from Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, Kolkata, he worked as a postdoc fellow at the Max Planck Institute in Germany, 
and the Roswell Patterson Cancer Institute at Buffalo, USA. And then as a faculty at the University of Maryland School of Medicine at Baltimore, USA. He has about 30 years of research experience in glycobiology and lectins. He published over 100 research articles, including two books, and secured federal grant funding of over 5 million US dollars. He is a lead inventor of five US patents, fantastic, and currently serving as an editorial board member and a reviewer of many reputed journals. His current research involves the commercial development of Galactin 3 targeting high affinity glycotherapeutics for the treatment of prostate cancer. NAS fibrosis, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis fibrosis, and type 2 diabetes. With a few words, I invite Dr. Amit, and I am <coughs> privileged and proud that his Dr. Hafiz Amit is my second graduate student, the signing star in the <laughs> field of lectins and psychobiology. I am very proud, very much proud, saying Hafiz has gone to up. Thank you. Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's a very kind introduction, sir. And also, I thank you, um, organizer, and also Professor Sarajee for inviting this. Um, so, um, as you can see, my title is very optimistic title. Um, but intentionally, I added clinical just to emphasize a couple of things. Um, as is, glycomantra, so you will hear uh, in my talk industry perspective rather than basic research perspective. So I just want to make clear that what clinical means here. Clinical means here that not only we're interested to develop a drug, but also to develop a drug that has clinical utility that can be applied to the human clinical trials. And what does it mean? It means that it should have an acceptable um, toxicity, it should have favorable pharmacology, and there are two parts of pharmacology. One is pharmacokinetics. So we are expecting to have some reasonable stability in the drug, in the human system. And also, we are expecting to have some reasonable response to the target gene, which is galactin-3. So, and also, with that one, also we are expecting the therapeutic index should be lot more, at least 10 therapeutic index, and that gives us quote-unquote safe drug, you can call it. Uh, and also at the end, it should have a continuous supply of the drug, which means that ease of biomanufacturing of this drug. So with that in mind, let me start that very quickly. So our target gene here, galactin-3, and galactin-3 is a lectin. It need not, does not need any introduction, as you heard from Professor Ozeki in detail. Lectin is, in general, mediate cell cell interactions through lectin carbohydrate interactions. And what is galactin-3 looks like? Here you can see here at the end, here is a galactin-3. It is a member of galactin family. Uh, there are 15 members. And this, this is a chimeric structure. It's a little bit different to any other lectins, galactins here. And I can tell you more about that. It is very unique unlike other galactins, because it is itself is a monomer, but very high concentration, it can be multi-pentamer, or sometimes can be dimer as well. And unlike other galactins, it in most cases is act as a pro-inflammatory. So that gives a unique nature of this galactin-3. And this is something to do with this innate immunity as well. As you can know that from your basic standard uh, biochemistry or immunology, this is the damp molecules, danger-associated molecular patterns, and as well as the PAMP molecules, pathogen-associated molecular patterns. Galactin-3 sometimes acts as a damp molecule, and also sometimes it acts as a pattern recognition receptors, like a toll-like receptors. And since this, in the, when the tissue is damaged, the macrophage releases a lot of galactin-3, and that gives the pentamer, and that provides a stronger binding affinity to the glycoconjugates. 
and that sustained activation perhaps it's becoming pro-inflammatory rather than anti-inflammatory. And so for that reason, there is no surprise that galactin-3 is involved in many diseases. And I'm putting here some examples of the disease. These are all associated with the chronic inflammations and galactin-3 is there. So our hope was that, that's why we put one magic bullet. Our hope is that we're going to develop one drug and that hopefully we can treat not only cancer, but also other diseases as well. So here, due to time constraints, and also I'm not going to talk about everything, but I've been working in cancer, particularly prostate and cancer for many years, uh, which I'm going to talk about more, but very, my recent work is also NAS fibrosis as well as type 2 diabetes. I'm going to touch upon that as well. So as I mentioned to you, clinical utility, right? So which means that with that aspect, we have, some, we have some benefit, some advantage over that. So the, the product we're talking here, it is a biologic product, is originally derived from edible fish, the cod fish we eat, which means it is a natural product. So and we call it GM 101. And so we're, and this is the, Affinity to galactin-3 is in the range of picomolar range, as you can see here, this is a biosensor data. Is the monosaccharide is on the micromolar range. So it is essentially, it is a 10 to the power 6 order of magnitude higher affinity to the galactin-3. And so we're expecting that, since it's a natural product, we're expecting less toxicity in the in vivo when you do human clinical trial. And also since the galactin-3 and natural endogenous interaction in the range of nanomolar, our drug interaction is picomolar, so it will outcompete the endogenous interactions. So that's also advantage that it should work as a good drug. And since um, I mentioned to you therapeutic index, so we know that it's a maximum tolerated dose in animal model is more than 50 milligram per kilogram. While in our animal models, therapeutic dose is a microgram to milligram per level. So we already have 50 fold, less greater than 10 therapeutic index. So that should have a quote unquote safe drug that we're expecting. So, so let's move to the prostate cancer very easily. So far in my, 20 years research in prostate cancer, we did several models. I'm going, not going to talk about that. Only I'm going to talk at the very relevant uh, models that we are doing drug resistant, metastatic, castration resistant prostate cancer. And I'll tell you in a minute what it was, it, that means. Then followed by NAS fibrosis, then type 2 diabetes. I'm going to just touch upon this very quickly. So to give you a background on prostate cancer, it is a, it is a um, leading cause of cancer death. Uh, there are four stages, one and two. This is the organ confined cancer, and this is the treatable. Um, but this the stage three is the move to the seminal vesicles, and also the stage four is the metastatic stage. Um, and if you, if you look at the literature, that you know that is the development of normal prostate, as well as the prostate cancer, is very much regulated by androgen, androgen signaling. And this is the testosterone, male hormone, it gets converted to dehydrotestosterone. In the cytoplasm, it binds to androgen receptor. It's activated, that's a phosphorylation. There's a dimerization. Then it's translocated to the nucleus. Then it promotes a um, whole bunch of androgen receptor-related genes. And that actually provides the survival of the normal prostate as well as cancer. cancer. So most of the drugs in this area actually related to androgen signaling blockage, and that's called is androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, this, is a, this is a cartoon, um, is a, it is an elaborative form, and with further details, but I just wanted to put, put that one just to show that where we are in terms of um, the, the prostate cancer therapy, what is your objective in which stage, which I can tell you here in a minute, and also, how is this prostate cancer getting treated over, over time? Uh, and what are the signaling arts and how this, what are these uh, drugs are? So here I can see here, the androgens is, it is a hypothalamus pituitary uh, uh, axis, and most of the androgens 
released by the testes, that is about 80 to 90 percent, while 10 to 20 percent released by this adrenal gland here. And as I mentioned to you, that androgens moves to the cytoplasm and bounds to the androgen receptor, then goes to the uh, nucleus that I already mentioned to you. Um, and, and you can see here, as soon as the prostate cancer detected, perhaps in the early stages, it gets treated by radiotherapy or maybe local therapy, then PSA level goes down. But unfortunately, over some time, PSA goes up. Then at that time, um, doctors are advised uh, to treat this patient mostly by the uh, androgen signaling blockage. So that's a guideline, uh, NCCN guideline, National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, and that which means that removal of removal the source of androgens, and that removal that's a uh, either by chemical treatment or by surgical removal of the testes, and so that is called androgen deprivation here. And the chemical treatment is called actually LH, RH agonist or antagonist that blocked this synthesis of the androgen by the testis. So that takes care of a lot of androgen, almost 90% androgens by doing this process. And there are many drugs, there are very good drugs uh, to treat the early stage of prostate cancer, which is this. It is a metastasis almost, but it is also sensitive to the androgens. So that's what is called androgen deprivation therapy. And also some patients receive also chemotherapy as well at the same time. Then after for a while, the patients again started rising PSA. So at that point, patient is already metastasized. They already resistant to castration, either chemical or surgical. So they have only one choice because why they're still rising? Remember this another 10% androgen coming from the adrenal glands. So that 10% androgens coming from the adrenal glands, that actually binds to the androgen receptors that thrives the cancer. So that's why at that stage, the two drugs comes in. One is called Zytiga, which is ab abiraterone. And it is the drug that blocks biosynthesis of the androgen in the adrenal gland. And there's another drug is called Enzalutamide, it's called Extendi that blocks interaction between androgen receptor and androgen. So these are the two blockbuster drugs. Is combined sale is about $4 billion in the US market. But here is the interesting part. Even though it's a $4 billion market, it extends the life of the prostate cancer patient at this stage only by five months compared to the chemotherapy drug. So that gives only five months life to this patient with this drug, combination drug. But Soon, this patient again started developing resistance and they started tumor growth is there. There are no drugs. So that's why I call it unmet medical needs. And here we come here. That's our objective. We are trying to develop a drug that essentially should be treating, or that's we hoped that we can treat it, drug resistant MCRPC. And why this, at this stage, drug is not working? The reason is that Patients that are treated with Zytiga or Extendi, they express the variate uh, mutant form of the androgen receptor. Androgen receptor itself, there are three domains, including ligand binding domain that binds to the androgen here. But ARV7 that lacks um, ligand binding domain, so that's why enzalutamide doesn't work here. But still, it can be, can be activated and can promote um, a lot of AR-related genes. So, so here is a long introduction. So this is our objective rationale. Uh, there is a good paper by Abraham Ra's group. They showed that they injected a LN cap cell, which does not express galactin-3. And there is another cell line, LN cap, that is transfected by gal galactin-3, which means that LN cap is expressing galactin-3. Then that two groups, when they started tumor at this level, then they they, they castrated those two groups, like a medical castrations, which means that they blocked that androgen in that mice. And you can see here, only the group that received LN cap, wild LN cap, did not grow the tumor, but the mice that received galactin-3 containing LN cap, they st they're growing like a vehicle treated, which means that the galactin-3 is giving resistance to the androgen. And in our lab, we also tested LN cap that we challenged with abiraterone. LN cap did not express galactin-3 in the beginning that you can see here as well. 
but as soon as you challenge with abelotron, it expresses galactin-3. And in our MTT assays, ln cap does not respond to our drug because there is no galactin-3, but once it's challenged and expressed galactin-3, it is responsive. So this gives us rationale to go after this MCRPC model, and we had a grant uh, from the NCI, and with the NCI grant, we did this test in an animal model. That's called PDX model in humanized mice, humanized PDX model. So essentially, this is we are putting here, this is the immune compromised mice that was radio ablated in order to kill the remaining immune cells of the mice immune remaining cells. Then it was introduced human uh, CD34 uh, hematopoietic stem cells in order to create human immune cells in these mice. So once it's developed, we checked in flow cytometry, once it's developed the human chimera, then we injected a real tumor, that human tumor that is coming from the human patient. That is the MCRPC tumor. And when these mice started developing this tumor, it's about 200 millimeter cube. Then, then we challenged these mice with abiraterone drug, exactly mimicking this patient scenario that I told you. Then when this, um, these mice became resistant to um, abiraterone, then we started our drug MGM-101 alone or in combination with abiraterone. And this is the result you see here that GM101 alone is, uh, there is a fair amount of tumor shrinkage compared to the vehicle. Uh, this is the um, apoptosis of this uh, vehicle treated tumor. And when it is combined with abiraterone, it is similar effect. So our drug either alone or in combination with abiraterone has the same effect. Um, GM101 increases survival of abiraterone resistant MCRPC in benign mice. And since it targets galactin-3, we looked at the expression of galactin-3. It lowers the galactin-3 expression both in the tumor as well as the, is the serum. Here is an um, important um, uh, slide um, um, result here in the context of androgen signaling. Our drug modulates androgen receptor signaling um, just by lowering the expression of androgen receptor, which, which, is, which is very important um, result because none of the drugs either extend your uh, uh, angelotamide or any available drugs nowadays, they, uh, they cannot um, lower the expression of androgen receptor itself. And a lot of companies and also there, there are a lot of drugs on clinical trial nowadays, uh, they just try to uh, reduce that uh, androgen receptor expression in, in this in type of patients. So we are able to show that, that it reduces androgen receptor expression level, not only full AR level, but also ARV7 as well, which is very important in the last stage of uh, MRC, MCRPC patient. And also this is the serine 81 androgen receptor. Uh, that is the phosphorylation that is responsible for translocating cytoplasm to nucleus. That's also is also go going down here. Uh, so we're happy about that result. And it also lowers the expression of AR-related genes like HCAPP and TMPSS2 and also other genes as well. And so I'm very quickly I'm moving to NAS fibrosis um, due to time constraint. And also there is an issue of the IP protection. I'm not going to show you the data here. Uh, only I'll, I'll take my words on it. Um, I'm going to just describe what we have did. But here's the background here. Uh, that there is a lot of, um, as you say, I told you, galactin-3 associated with a disease that has chronic inflammation, and this all fibrosis is due to chronic inflammations. So it happens that damaged tissues, like a mostly macrophage, they release lots of galactin-3, and also the TGA beta and other stuff, they bind to the TGA receptor, receptor that induces EMT conversions, and also binding to the TGA receptors, and that sustained prolonged activation of this fibroblast leads to, leads to, um, leads to fibrosis. So we thought that our GMO no drug can be, it, um, can, can be useful to treat a NAS. So again, um, I told you that due to IP issue, I'm not showing the data exactly, but I'll tell you exactly what we have. We tried the two different models, and in the first model, this is more like a NAS model. Uh, we are able to show that stat statistically significant reduction of statosis score, fibrosis score, ballooning degeneration, lobular inflammation, NAFLD score, and NAS score, by the way, there are no drugs available at this stage to treat NAS fibrosis. And a lot of companies, they're desperately trying to treat 
get the NAS drug. So there's a lot of competition. Um, nowadays, the patients are only treated by anti-inflammatory anti drug. That's all. There's no drug at all. And we did also another model, CCL4 mice model, that's also reduced the fibrosis. Very quickly, type 2 diabetes. Um, oh, so here, there's a good paper. Um, um, it's published a cell by from Ole, Olemsky, Olemsky lab. Um, they showed that galactin-3 is involved in insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. Again, type 2 diabetes is also a disease of chronic inflammation. We know that. So what exactly happens here? So in normal scenario, is how does it work? Insulin binds to insulin receptors. It activates insulin receptor uh, and also insulin receptor substrate and other gene. Then it's um, their signals to um, uh, glucose transporters, then goes to the surface and there is a glucose uptake. So that's a normal scenario. So in what happens in type 2 diabetes, there is a, because of tissue damage, uh, there is a, um, uh, macrophage in the, in the fat area, they release lots of galactin-3 and it binds to insulin receptor. Insulin receptor is a glycoprotein. And once it binds to insulin receptor, somehow it it's, uh, interferes with this insulin signaling, normal signaling. So that's why it's giving insulin resistance. So we thought that we could use this, our drug, to treat type 2 diabetes. So we, uh, with another grant from NIDDK NIH, uh, we are able to show that our drug was reduced, um, reduced the fasting blood glucose levels, also insulin tolerance and glucose tolerance, and also activation of insulin receptors. So this is our drug pipeline. We have so many drugs, but this is the work actively working, uh, metastatic prostate cancer right now, also NAS fibrosis and type 2 diabetes. I'm not going to talk about anything here. Um, and this is our timeline where we are here. Um, so we passed all these stages with the NIH grant mostly. Uh, we are right here right now um, before IND submission to the FDA. IND is called uh, in investigation on new drug submissions. You need to have that permission in order to uh, clinical trial in human. So we need to do some um, uh, critical experiments like uh, toxicity in monkey uh, as well as some uh, master cell bank for CGM to manufacturing. That's we are hoping to get very soon. Uh, probably we are 18 months away before IND filing. And of course, there's a lot of money needed for that one. And so we recruited a business person who is actually actively raising funds here. So that's our hope. So we should be able to do clinical trial very soon. So in summary, we developed a proprietary biologic drug um, that is, has a picomolar affinity. And also we demonstrated efficacy in many, many diseases like MCRPC as well as the NAS fibrosis and type 2 diabetes. And this here, I would like to acknowledge my lab members that this is the long journey we started uh, in the University of Maryland when I was a faculty there. Uh, that started Galactin-3 work. Most of the work he did it, Prosun Guha, was published in PNS in a few years ago. Uh, at Glycomantra in a company, uh, there are a few others involved. And I have lots of collaborators in different diseases like here, uh, PDX model and also this transgenic model I did not talk about here, NAS fibrosis, Michael Briggs, and also diabetes model. Uh, Jiao San, uh, these are events, and also Dr. Banerjee, uh, he, he was here, she was he, there, um, and this is my funding from the NIH. So thank you so much for your listening. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for your excellent lecture, illustrative, and drug discovery, Galactin 3. Notorious prostate cancer, MCRCPC, but also type 2 diabetes and fibrosis, NAS, NAFALD, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. Thank you for the discovery, and all we hope that soon your drug will come to the market and the people will get free from the disease. Thank you very much. Only one question. Please. Yes, please. Only one. In in. So the galactin three uh, is present in the uh, uh, yeah prostate. Yeah. It is present prostate and PSA is an antigen, right? Yeah. Another antigen. Yeah. yeah. 
so it's there. And uh, I think galactin 3 expression is also occurred in many other. Yes, of course, yeah. It, it is everywhere, so basically. cancer occurs or in intermediate state. So how do you assess? So our initial goal is to get the drug for the MCRPC patients. But as since other, other cancer has also galactin-3, for example, colorectal cancer, ovarian cancer, we're hoping that we should be able to treat those cancer as well. So that's, so that's why it works. First you start something, then the doctor started prescribing off-level prescription, then you get the permission for the FDA. So that's a, that's a long, long, long run. Um, so yeah, and we hope that, that it will happen. We don't want to discriminate, so, yeah. The, the, yes, of course, that's our hope, yeah. Like all this fibrosis, not only liver, but also kidney, heart, they're also galactin-3 involved very well. But you have to start from one organ. You cannot do everything in one, all at once. So, let's see. Okay. <laughs> now I, I invite Dr. Professor Deepak Banerjee, uh, to start his lecture before I introduce that he is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry School of Medicine, University of Puerto Rico. And his PhD from the University of Calcutta, then moved as a postdoctoral fellow in the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And then uh, he has many um, awards he received, that is, Member Academic Senate. And he is a uh, Fellow of the Triple AS in USA and Lawrence Barkley National Laboratory. He worked there and he has made many patents, many papers. He's a very, very big uh, biodata. So uh, I just uh, say a few words. That is, he is an editorial board member of Dyke Conjugate Journal, Molecular and Cellular Biology biology and owns patents from the Union, United States trademark and is an executive board member International Symposium of the Biochemical Roles for of cell surface macromolecules in India. With this few words, Professor Banerjee, take the floor. I don't think that anybody reads all of the details. <laughs> you don't have to say. We are here just to share uh, our research findings and gain some experience from the questions of the audience. Okay, let me, before I start, let me thank Professor uh, Vijayalakshmi uh, Saxena, the president of the Indian Association of uh, no, no, no. Sci Indian Science Congress Association and our chairperson, Professor uh, Vishnu Bhada Chatterjee, to invite me. Uh, to share our, our research. I've also not forgotten the people behind the scene, which all the volunteers and other coordinators trying to make this Congress as uh, lively as possible. So with that, I will go back to my route, which is glycobiology. I mean, basically I started, got uh, trained in this area when I was a graduate school at the University, uh, at the Velour Medical College. <clears throat> Now, those who know about the glycosines, glycosines is, uh, I would say, is holded, holding by a pillar of four Gs. One is called glycoprotein, other is called glycolipid, the proteoglycans, and glycosaminoglycans. Each of them, they provide their biological functions, but they also, I'm sure that they communicate with, with each other, but I don't think we have the tools to demonstrate, or we, are, we have a very little knowledge, you know, to do that, you know, to understand that process. Now, the, the one I'm going to share with you by, the, by ac ad, uh, accessing or addressing the glycobiology or glycosines 
can we develop some sort of a therapeutics? And one of the focus, I'm, 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 my focus is at this moment, is on breast cancer. And so that uh, basically I'm trying to share with you a, a birth of a concept of a glycotherapy for treating breast cancer. Uh, which one is your pointer? This one is the pointer. Let me. Okay, and I can. Okay, so um, I have to. Don't get scared. Okay, the breast tissue is full of different cell types, and so that when the cancer originates, it could come from any anywhere. But that there are four, or three to four molecular subtypes, which are hormone receptor positive, hormone receptor uh, negative, HER2 positive, or the triple negative. And the most uh, de devastating form is the triple negative because we don't have any treatment available for that disease. Uh, the second thing is that, that about 200, 2 million cases are being diagnosed every year worldwide. It's, it's a global problem, and about death rate is about half a million. And the, to cost, as it costs billions to provide the uh, necessary uh, health care for those people. The India is also not lagging behind, and there are some studies that done in the past, and you can see that you know, the distribution of the cancer patients in different, uh, different, different states. Here I highlighted two different states. One is for our um, chairperson, Professor Chatterjee, is in Kolkata, and the other one for the population people from Nagpur. I can see the percentage is very high. Uh, but the mortality rate, in, in the cancer mortality rate in India is twice than China and three times than United States. So theoretically, we have to do something in order to not only to reduce the mortality rate, but try to eradicate, eliminate the disease if possible. So the bottom line is we are looking for, I, 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 and, 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 and I wouldn't say the magic bullet, which uh, Professor, late Professor Arlick um, always mentioned to that. I'm trying to look for a silver bullet because werewolf is out there to kill it. So the, the hallmark of cancer, which has uh, been um, reviewed by this group, Weinberg and his group, and they said there are six core principles, but the professor, late professor Judah Falkman already proposed in 1985 that the angiogenesis, which means the blood vessels, probably the key of the cancer growth. And the cancer cells could be mutated but until and unless then implanted and, and, and has connection with the blood vessels or blood supplies, they are not going to go anywhere. So the ma majority of times, we as a, investigators, we are just focusing only one or the, not the other. So my approach is to take this whole thing as a holistic approach that we should apply, approach both the um, vessels as well as the, um, I'm sorry, that I can use this. And yeah, the, the, as you can see, there is a, uh, the vessel, the, the tumor cells, when they're growing, they attract the new vessels. So the, for their growth, so that if we have a compound or a target or, or a drug, that we can eliminate or target both of them so that probably we can make this individual uh, uh, the disease free. So the, what happened, that, that's what we, it has become very handy at that moment. We had in a serendipitous way, we got a pure non-transport culture of, um, um, of what's called the um, um, uh, capillary endothelial cells, which is responsible for making the blood vessels. And here, the, uh, you know, all this uh, structural, you know, structural studies they show it, it's really reminiscent of that. An important thing that they do grow, and uh, they have a specific uh, uh, doubling time, and they, they respond to the extracellular signaling by making them the faster growth. That's uh, the, the, then it becomes a very, um, useful tool for us that to, to, to uh, uh, look forward to, get, to, to regulate that process, those processes. Now, while characterizing, we also found that they, let me see. Yeah, they, they also um, express cell surface glycoproteins. These are high mannose type structures. These are red ones, the complex type structures by the lectin staining. We have heard quite a bit of that. They also express some Decent glycoproteins, one of them is factor eight, is a 270 kilodalton protein, and they have a direct relationship between the cellular proliferations and the glycoprotein expression. And if you block the glyco glycoprotein um, expression or some other uh, uh, inactivate the factor eight activity, then the cells 
here cannot, <coughs> in, uh, they lost the invasive characteristics of that. So they have a very nice correlation between these two. So I have to take you to this next phase, is the cancer cells also express a various types of N glycans, aspiraging glycoproteins. This is one of the examples, and you can see the whole battery of the structures are being expressed. The other second type of, it, it, these are all pure uh, uh, breast cancer cell lines, and, and this is the, this one from the high metastatic cancer. So if you take those pictures and put side by side, you see there's a lot of differences. The problem is that by targeting one of those structures, we'll never, be, we'll never achieve to cure or develop treatment for cancer. So we'll never be able to cure cancer. So we have to come up with some other different approaches so that taking the advantage of those molecules. So that what do we do that, that done, now this, Structures, which I just showed it to you, they are assembled inside the cell in glycome, which means that there is a gene, needs to have a gene expression for the glycosyl transferases from the endoplasmic reticulum, which builds this 14 sugar long oligosaccharide um, on, a, on, a, on a dolly called backbone. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, and, 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 um, uh, and it's regulated, the process is highly regulated by the extracellular signaling, which we have mostly worked on the cyclic MP mediated pathway. So in this pathway, this 14 sugar long oligosaccharide is necessary for transferring its lipid backbone to the aspiration residue of the glycoprotein for his further processing and then, uh, then go to the respective places. So we are focusing on these two enzymes. The first one is the GPT, NSF glucosaminal 1 phosphate transferase, and DPMS. Interesting enough, they have some sort of a relationship because the way we found it out in a serendipitous way by somebody uh, others as well, that if you activate a DPMS, then the activity of this enzyme GPT is also going up. But when you block the GPT activity, the DPMS activity, it also dies down. So we are trying to figure out what exactly the relationship and how it has been established. But that gives you a wonderful windows for us to look into different ways. So I won't be able to talk anything about the DPMS because that it has been advanced. So we have published quite a bit on that and some of the works are in the process uh, of, of, of the manuscripts is being done. Problem was with the bioinformatic analysis. So it's been completed. So what are we going to do? We're going to use uh, with, the, with, the, with the, the great discovery of the Japanese scientists that was a pro the one molecule called the tunicomycin. It's a pyrimidine nucleoside, and it's a competitor uh, of, uh, of this enzyme system because it blocks the GPT activity. And, and then, yeah, so that's right over here. It does not make the oligosaccharide lipid, and you can see this goes down. So if it happens, then the uh, glyc proteins are not glycosylated. You can see this third one. There's hardly any signal uh, been um, recognized by the CONI or WGA and the factor rate level is also de decreased. So when we talk about that, what happens to the protein? If the proteins are not glycosylated, it's been said that they are some unfolded, but those, still today we have not been able to this, uh, identify any unfolded proteins because there's no technology. So I then requested the, my chemist friends that can you measure some of the things? They said, yes, we can use Raman spectroscopy and with the CO stretching. And the analysis they did that only thing said, all the, your proteins are denatured. I said, that's more than enough for us because we don't know what the, uh, the, deform, uh, inf uh, the, the uh, unfolded protein is. But now the problem comes when these proteins accumulate, the cells will have two ap approaches, either to degrade them internally with the proteasomal pathway or it may create some stress depending upon how the balance is shifted on, a, that, um, on, on, on the seesaw um, platform. The most of the time, probably the accumulation is much faster than the other one. So that's why it generates an ER stress. And the ER stress is measured by the GRP78. Sorry. Uh, G on, and, and GRP78 is a master regulator. Then it takes this three transducer, IRE, PIC, PARC, and, uh, and ATH. Two of them are, are, tra are transcription regulator. This is a translation regulator. And they regulate the ER, uh, UPR-related gene called the unfolded protein response mediated process. Please remember, I am working on unfolded protein response signaling at the University of Puerto Rico, abbreviated as UPR. Okay, so all of those things are saying upgrade, upregulated, so there is a signaling. Uh, now the important thing is that when we tested this compound on the, on the cell lines in presence of vascular endothelial growth factors, that the cells are dying, 
but the growth factor is not able to rescue it. So that's a great advantage, and that showed as well, this has some great potential for that, and uh, either FGF2 or VGF would not be able to uh, recover or reverse this process. Now, the, the, uh, when, when this, media, if this happens, the cells undergoes, um, uh, well, this, there's a cell cycle arrest, and it happens early in the beginning of the start one, the E2F with the transcription factor, which is down-regulated, by, by knocking down further, it does not have any additive or synergistic action. But you know, there's a lot of pathways that are being affected that we, we, we characterize some of them. We work on the G1 specific, G1 specific pathways, cyclin, cyclin, D1, D2, or the CDK4, and also the P53 pathways. There's a number of pathways that have been activated. And no way I can, I can detect, I can, I can discuss this one, nor I can reach to, because this will take me my whole biological uh, life you know, to find out how many of these pathways are there. But all of them, many of them, are being, are being affected. So, and you can see the cells undergoes apoptosis. This, uh, you can see the morphological changes and all kinds of things happening. Uh, it, it inhibits the uh, in, in, in chemotoxic activity, and, and, it, and it says that it, it, it yeah, induces apoptosis. Now, just wanted to quickly summarize. How many minutes do we have, sir? Two minutes? Two minutes, okay. Then we move to the um, in vivo model, which there's a no tumor, but we, we can be able to show it that it, in, in, it inhibits in vivo uh, angiogenesis. Then we move to the cancer model. We use the both uh, double negative, uh, sorry, that's, yeah, it's, it's a double negative breast cancer model, and you can see that the tumor cell is growth quite, you know, as a different, as a concentration, and it needs about 15 times more taxol, which is the FDA approved drug, to come to the same level of this. Um, uh, to, to, to come to the same stage. And also also tested on the triple negative breast cancer, which does not have any, 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 any treatment, and it's a highly metastatic cancer, would we'll we'll give them orally, and we are able to see the uh, reduction of tumor growth uh, by 65% in, 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 in what, in one week. So that the, the, you can do the tissue sections, you can find that there are year stress and, and decrease of the glycan, analysis, glycan expression. Uh, the tumor cells are, there's a variety of tumor cells, half a dozen we have tested, all of them are sensitive to tunicomycin. And it follows the same pattern of the, of the, of the cell cycle arrest followed by, um, um, fo 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 followed by uh, UPR pathway, signaling pathway. They, they, they inhibit the colonotonicity of the tumor, and this is the conclusion, the tunicomycin goes to ER, and that in includes the GRP78 and follows, uh, and then uh, block the angiogenesis and the tumor growth. Um, so we have, in order to get to the, uh, the, to, to the target tissue, we are still working on how to get to that. So we have made some nanoparticles uh, of tunicomycin, and uh, we'll be, we'll be able to show, we are able to show that it is uh, three times more potent than the native compound. And also, it blocks the, uh, wind signaling pathway because this is a developmental profile. The tumor growth follows the similar uh, strategy, so it, it follows. So now you can give it, give you an idea that how many different pathways it can interfere and then and, and can reduce the uh, proliferations of tumor cells. So then, here are my colleagues, collaborators, and students who have contributed on this one. And funding comes from the different sources. And here is Puerto Rico. This is Atlantic Ocean. This is the port. So anytime you visit. Even the January 1st, you can swim in the water, at the water. It's pretty warm. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, for your very interesting lecture, glycotherapy approach in a breast cancer. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Now, the last speaker, myself, what it is? I just sum up. This is, no? So my talk is a novel approach, sensitive approach to detect liver disease from blood serum. Now what is the liver disease? One is the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That is very common, 90% of us, we have the fatty liver, and that is mostly seen in the, which obese or overweight. And initially the nafal doesn't cause any harm, but over the time, this nafal also create some problem, and uh, one is that when the uh, uh, your nash 
the steatohepatitis, simple fatty liver that is only fat deposition in the liver, and narcissus that is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, that is where there is no fat but still there is some inflammation in the liver, and the fibrosis that is also the persistent uh, deposition of fat and inflammation, and uh, uh, the scar tissue develop in the in the liver, and. And this is called the fibrosis, and cirrhosis is the very serious uh, damage of the liver, and may, because uh, mm, there is a lot of a scar formation in the liver tissue, and then also nodules that is lumpy, and this is very dangerous, and that leads to liver cancer even. And our global prevalence of nephrit is from 25 percent to uh, 30 percent. Now hepatitis B, hepatitis B is another very, uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis uh, B is caused by the uh, viruses, uh, hepatitis A, B, C, D and E and out of this B and C is very um, dangerous, severe and threat to the global health and some people with hepatitis B, uh, they are at the in a few weeks, uh, they have the acute hepatitis, but with the passage of time, this uh, hepatitis B also transforms to the chronic hepatitis B, and then chronic hepatitis B, uh, uh, that is, uh, over the time, that produces the cirrhosis and then the uh, cancer. Over three, more than 350, 350 uh, million people affected in the world by this. The global hepatitis C virus is also very uh, common, but only thing that the diagnosis is not so easily, and particularly in India, so uh, that the, it is uh, increasing the global hepatitis C virus infection. Uh, it is only 2% around in the world. Now, hepatitis in India, and that is 12.5 million, that is HCV carriers. Now, uh, due to lack of uh, screening uh, HCV in India, uh, so the, uh, the disease is increasing. The cirrhosis, it is a consequence of the um, uh, chronic liver um, disease characterized by uh, the replacement of liver tissues by the scar already is told you and uh, that is not only cirrhosis developed by the hepatitis B and C but also by the alcoholism, those who take the more alcohol intake then the cirrhosis is very much possible and uh, the B hepatitis B infection and that causes to, that transforms to a liver cancer without cirrhosis. But in case of hepatitis C, that first hepatitis C then transforms to cirrhosis and then to liver cancer. This is the picture of the, uh, the um, you see the cirrhosis, HCV uh, cirrhosis and the alcoholic liver cirrhosis, how the liver shows that the nodule and the scar formation. And you see that first, at the beginning, the small cuss formation, then it is uh, increasing, and at last, the stage three, that is nodulis formation, you see that the, some nodule lumpy. Now, the hepatocellular carcinoma is a common type of primary liver cancer, and that uh, is uh, caused not only by the hepatitis B and C, but also, also alcoholism uh, and, and from the cirrhosis. And in the global estimate is that the 11.6 uh, cases per 100,000 men and 3.4 per 100,000 women. And uh, 1.6 is the uh, India observed, 1.6% uh, per year, the incidence of HCC. Now, after that, the diagnosis, the routine biochemical uh, analysis is done um, for the hepatitis B and C, and that is a prothrombin time hepat uh, hepato, um, your index, and bilirubin, and the antibody IgM for HEAVDEV, and other the liver enzymes that is aspirate, aspirate uh, amino transferase, alanine amino transferase, and alkaline phosphatase, all these things. However, 10 to 20 percent of the uh, acute hepatitis that actually transforms to the chronic hepatitis and among the chronic hepatitis, uh, 40 percent that, that progress to the cirrhosis in which about 10 percent 
from the cirrhosis, 10% that develops cancer. The examination of the cirrhosis is nothing but the ultrasonography in abdominal CT and MRI. But liver biopsy is also the gold standard, but it has so many complications. The, that is lack of sensitivity and discomfort to the patient and the risk of complication and expert pathology is needed. Now, this is the mortality rate of liver disease in India. In the first picture, A shows that is the uh, acute hepatitis, that is 2000, 2016, and 2010 and 2016. This is the statistics that cirrhosis is very high. You see 109.5 per million of population. Another one is the cirrhosis. You see, they are also very high in the cirrhosis of all type, but the cirrhosis also developed from the HVV and HCV. So HVV related cirrhosis and HCV related cirrhosis, they are also, you see that liver cirrhosis is high. We come to the cancer, then if we come to the cancer, all liver cancer, that is very high, and you see that is 25, 23.6 is the per million of the people, all liver cancer. In this way, this HIV related cancer is also high, HIV related cancer is also high. Now, actually, there are so many diagnostic treatment. There one is the, suppose the AFP, alka, uh, alpha fetoprotein is the liver uh, in the cancer. That is the uh, one, the diagnostic marker but it is not enough because 74% of Indian, uh, Indian population, 74% of the uh, liver cancer uh, is without uh, positivity of the uh, AFP. And uh, another is the ALT, ALT that is alkaline uh, uh, phosphatase. That is also uh, not always true in case of the liver cancer because it has been shown that is ALT is normal, quite normal, but when the liver damage is maximum. So there is a need for accurate uh, biochemical marker. That there are so many markers, uh, glycosidation changes, there is some glycoproteins that the, the previously it was done. So this is the first time we have done the phosphorylation. The how the change of phosphorylation, phosphate group is there in the, the and the how the abnormal phosph aberrant phosphorylation can develop in the uh, disease. When the, the, during the pathogenesis of the disease, the phosphorylation is changes and uh, serum is as a biomarker. And phosphorylation is since it is a key play key role in the regulation of the your uh, biological and cellular processes, and uh, also phosphorylation means that is that is it, it from the circulatory system the this phosphorylated protein uh, comes to the uh, from the liver tissue to the circulatory system and there is in the serum. So serum is the best choice of among the non-invasive approach. There are other also saliva, serum and other body fluids, uh, urine also. And mass spectrometry is now introduced as a choice of, uh, choicest method to identify the phosphorylated proteins and its analysis and diagnosis of liver disease that is diagnosis of liver disease is done by apparent phosphorylation. Our approach is that the hepatitis B, I told you, is a very threat and that is the one cause of the liver cancer. So um, that is, uh, uh, despite the profound uh, treatment, uh, advancement in the diagnosis and treatment modalities, many of the chronic liver disease still show a high relapse rate. And so we just moved on to the hmm, phosphorylated protein to analyze, and this is the picture shows that is the, uh, the phosphorylated proteins are shown by the, there is a very special dye, that is ProQ diamond dye. We have found that the four phosphorylated protein of molecular weight 25, 50, 70, and 75. And that 
has been again quantified by the uh, uh, ELISA result and the uh, Western blot, immunoblot. And these are the source here. That, that is, you see uh, that the, the jail picture in the left side and the right side is the, uh, that is the uh, ELISA results, that is uh, using the phosphor specific antibody, that is anti phosphoserine uh, antibody. And uh, this is another one that is the ELISA, that is the immunoblot system. And the immunoblot in the, there are, the when the phosphoserine antibody is used, there are three bands that appear 25, 50, and 75. And when threonine antibody, threonine, that is anti phosphotheonine antibody is used in the Western blot, then only two bands are used. It means that is the phosphorylation took place in the serine and theorine. These two. Now we so we went to move to the 2D gel electrophoresis, and this shows the electrophoresis. There are seven spots. These seven spots are uh, that we have analyzed by the mass spectrometry. And this is the result of the mass spectrometry. If I say, uh, this is the mass spectrometry result. There are the seven, seven spots and the gene finger protein C. Uh, gene finger, what happened? Ah, you see, the gene finger protein 135ZNF that the expression is very high in the chronic hepatitis B and alpha to glycoprotein of the molecular 32 kilo dalton that is in the liver cirrhosis and in the liver cancer there is the hypothetical protein of 25 kilo dalton and you see that is marked by this uh, subtle that is it is gradually increasing it means that is the chronic hepatitis B that actually moved to the Latin superior to liver cirrhosis and finally to liver cancer. Now our approach was to this take the peptide sequence from the gene finger protein as it is very much expressed 135 JNF 135. We just synthesized the sequence peptide and after the synthesis, this is a purified, we have synthesized the two, by synthesizer, two proteins, two proteins. One is the phospho and the non-phospho, that is controlled, purified by HPLC, and then characterized by uh, mass spectrometry. This is the result of the mass spectrometry. It shows that it's a pure one, the next, last one, and now we have tried it to develop the ELISA results, and that is in the way of patents. So I cannot go in details. This shows that is the different HV means healthy volunteer, then CHB chronic hepatitis B, liver cirrhosis, and HCC, that is cancer. Here we have normalized this our result, and this we modified this result with this, that is, we multiplied this 100 times, and we found that here, the liver cirrhosis, CHB, is related, that is the related third one. Oh, no, no, no. Uh -huh. Anyway, I'm not competent. Yeah. Anyway, that this is our result where we get 100% sensitivity in the liver cirrhosis. The third picture shows we have taken the 11 sample, others are 20 sample, and you see it is very difficult to get the liver cirrhosis sample. Why? Because the liver cirrhosis patients Either they die, but the complication, that is the end. Another one, 
or they move to the cancer immediately. So it is very difficult, in my experience, very difficult to get the liver cirrhosis patients. Anyway, this is the accurate result and this result we develop for our commercial point of view and this is funded by ICMR translation research. My two advisors and collaborators are with me, one Dr. Chinmay Panda, is the head of the Department of Oncogene Regulation and National Cancer Institute, and the Dr. Hafiz Ahmed. So here I stop because I cannot go into details because it is on the process of development. So thank you very much. I think I cover in a very simple way. And uh, because I, I want to uh, give the floor to other professor SPCs. Questions from audience. Mm -hmm. Questions, questions from audience. Sure, 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 sure. I'd love to answer. Yes, it has the binding affinity of zinc finger protein. That is the phospho zinc finger protein. It has the binding affinity. Yeah, uh, Laura, please. Binding affinity we have studied. But it is very natural, I showed you. Okay. Okay, if there is no question, then I, I conclude as a chairman also. Uh, if, please, madam, please. Okay. Something from us. Uh, now I request Honorable Chairperson Dr. B. P. Chatterjee to kindly felicitate our today's guest speaker with memento as a token of love and respect. On behalf of 108 Indian Science Congress and Rashtra Santa Tukuroji Maharaj Nagpur University. Dr. Ch uh, Deepak Chatterjee, sir. Doctor. Ha, Dr. Deepak Chatterjee, sir. He is Banerjee and he is Chatterjee. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. It's been a pleasure to give this token to uh, uh, the memento as a token of appreciation to Dr. Banerjee. Please remember, Puerto Rico is part of the United States. You can give <laughs> Dr. Hafiz Ahmad, sir. Professor Ozeki, sir. Ozeki, from Japan, Yokohama. Now I request all the guest speakers to come up on the dais for the group picture. And I give thanks to all the speakers to keep in 
time. Now I request Dr. Pail Thaure, Madam, Head Postgraduate Teaching Department of Law, RTMNU, to propose a formal vote of thanks. A very good morning to all of you. Indeed, it was a very interesting session. Uh, I think uh, it is said that to believe or to understand in truth, we must believe in science. And after going through all these presentation, uh, we all can say this thing that now we have started in having this belief that the cancer is going to be cured. And uh, on behalf of uh, 108 Indian Science Congress and Rashtra Santa Tukadoji Maharaj Nagpur University, I express my heartfelt thanks to our today's chairperson, Professor B.P. Chatterjee, sir, for successfully conducting today's interesting session so thank you so much sir at the outset i would also like to express my heartfelt thanks to dr hafiz ahmed sir dr professor deepak banerji sir and professor yeshu Hiroki ozeki sir thank you so much and and i i want to express it on my personal behalf that i really wish that you all should complete your research and please provide us with those drugs which is needed for the mankind so i extend my best wishes to all of you to successfully complete your research work and save the mankind thank you so much everyone D uh, thank you so much dear participants and delegate we are starting the next session right now so please be seated we are already getting late so we have to be on time thank you so much thank you everybody thank you Hello. A very good morning to all of you. I, Shikha Gupta, lecturer, PGDT of Law, RTMNU. Extend a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the 108th uh, Indian Science Congress and Rashtan Tukroji Maharaj, Nagpur University, to the plenary session number 16 on natural products in healthcare and industry, perspective in sustainable development. Before we proceed uh, with the session, I would like to give few instructions to the participant. Please kindly be seated throughout the session. Please keep your phones in silent. And in case if you have any queries, all the queries will be taken at the end of the session with the permission of the chairperson. For this session, it is a matter of pride and privilege to have with us Honorable Dr. S.P. Singh. Uh, I, okay. I would like to introduce to you our today's esteemed chairperson, Dr. S.P. Singh. After obtaining his PhD from Lucknow University, Sir joined Kurukshetra University in 1965 and served the university as chairman, Department of Chemistry. On his superannuation, he was appointed as Professor Emeritus of the University for Life. Professor Singh has worked in various areas of organic chemistry and has published about 200 research papers and review articles besides supervising a large number of students for PhD degree. He has spent about five years in the University of Illinois at Chicago as postdoc fellow, Fulbright scholar and visiting research professor. He was INSA Royal Society fellow to University of Bath, UK twice and spent some time in CSIC, Spain. Besides research, Professor Singh has authored several books, Reaction Mechanism in Organic Chemistry, published by Macmillan Press, and more recently, a book on Pericilic Reaction, published by Academic Press London in 2016. He was also convener of UGC Committee on Curriculum Development. He was elected as president of the Chemical Science of the Indian Science Congress and later as his general secretary for a three-year term. 
He is now a permanent member of the Council of the Science Congress. For his service to science, Professor Singh was honored by the Prime Minister in, of India in 2014. He has also re received Lifetime Achievement Award of the Indian Chemical Society. We are extremely honored to have you, sir. Uh, now I request Dr. Kalpna Javad, Jadav, uh, Head of Department of Home Science, Rashtran Tukroji Maharaj, Nagpur University, to kindly welcome our today's chairperson with memento as a token of appreciation and gratitude. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Now I would request the chairperson to kindly proceed with the session. Also, I would like to mention, considering the paucity of time, each speaker will get 20 minutes to give his presentation. Over to you, sir. Although we are late by half an hour or so, but we should try to finish it uh, within the scheduled time. Um, I'm very happy that this session is dedicated to natural products and its applications. You know, natural products, they play a role everywhere in our life, as we have seen. Here, most notable concern for this very talk is how natural products uh, are used or have been used or had been used for human health. Uh, for every illness, we have to look towards nature. And if, if we look at the moment, moment, then there are two systems of medicine in the world which are relying heavily on the traditional knowledge. These are Chinese system and our Ayurved system. If you look and if you have interest in the uh, history of drugs in India, you will see how many drugs were there in use, not in the pure form, but uh, as a crude extract. Uh, the most notable example and classical example is that of uh, Sarp Gandha, Rolfia Serpentina, which provided us reserpine. Reserpine at that time could not be isolated because we did not have chromatography at that time. And uh, during 40s or early 50s, the Rolfia plant was taken by Siba to their lab in Switzerland and they isolated the pure compound that is reserpine, which was the best blood pressure medicine for about uh, 50 years before we had the calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. And you can see the power of um, Ayurveda even now. Opium is used. No, I'm ta talking used, not abused. Of course it is abused. The active principle of opium is morphine. And in spite of all the developments of uh, science, chemistry, biology, we do not have a better substitute uh, than morphine for pain relieving. You will be surprised to know, throughout the world, people are working hard to improve the quality of morphine, but they did not succeed so far. For terminal patients of cancer, still morphine dose is given so that they may at least die peacefully. Here again the question comes, my dear friends, that crude extract versus pure product. Suppose I talk of the opium extract and I talk of morphine, the pure component isolated from the abstract. Now in Ayurveda, the emphasis is on the crude extract and it is not without reason. Suppose crude extract of a plant may have 
components A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Only for example say H is active principle. But A, B, C, D, E are important because some of them may be, um, may be used for suppressing the toxicity caused by the uh, principal ingredient or there may be synergistic effect. That is why in our system, Ayurvedic system, we always emphasize on crude extract rather than on pure compounds. Whereas allopathy uh, says that we should have the uh, pure compound. So this is one aspect and we should not confuse our traditional system with the folk medicines. Folk medicines are without trial, just by experimentation, we take this leaf. Ayurvedic system is based on uh, thorough knowledge, kaf, put, vat. And still, we have to, because we had forgotten few hundred years of history, time will come and we are trying to catch up that how to uh, get the maximum benefit of uh, Ayurveda. Now, we can see the main diseases that we are having today. See, malaria, I am naming one. Malaria, of course, is not killing as many persons as people die of cancer or of heart problem. But malaria, we call it a neglected disease because we don't have malaria in, say, um, North America or in Europe. It is our indigenous disease of the tropical countries. So, not much research is being done on finding out uh, the drugs for uh, malaria. So it means Indians have to come up for uh, a proper drug. Now if you look at the history of malaria, both the drugs means one I, sh I should take quinine. Quinine has come from Sincona bark, again a plant product. And after 60, 70, 80 years, uh, no drug could come which could uh, uh, improve the qualities of the quinine. Of course, all these synthetic drugs, chloroquine, mapaquine, primaquine, they were derivative having quinoline nucleus and one substitute or the other substitute. The breakthrough in malaria therapy came in 1970 through Chinese system of medicine that is R.T. Mishnin. I don't know if you heard the name Artemis Nin, uh, discovered by a Chinese um, in 1972 from a Chinese plant, Artemisia Enver. And, and uh, wonderful, wonderful, a unique thing about Artemis Nin is, friends, you will be surprised, that the person who discovered Yu uh, Tutu, a lady, she was not or she is alive, she is not a scientist, she is not a PhD, she is not a professor in uh, any university, she was just a health worker, a pharmacist. Yet she could uh, discover Artemis then by experimenting the crude extract from the plant described in Chinese system of medicine on herself. And my fr dear friends, she got Nobel Prize in 2015. Perhaps the first person having Nobel Prize without PhD or being professor. So this is the power of the nature that we are talking about. And uh, when we have today's speakers, um, Professor Mati, Mati, he's talking about um, cancer drugs which may have lead from the plant products. Now, I, I have not to tell you that at least 60% of the medicines um, for cancer therapy are from nature. You can, you have, Taxol is the latest version. Then you have Campothecin, Podophyllin and Vinca alkaloids. I am sure that one day you will get lead from the plants to get the um, chemotherapy of cancer. The other speaker, Neera Raghav, she is working on drug delivery system and uh, she also has number of patents because she is coming from our department. Now, patents are 
very important thing very very important things if you re recollect most of you may not uh, remember 15 20 years before many europeans and american they filed patents on indian system of medicine like uh, kali mirch jeera haldi tulsi then dr mashelkar who was at that time director general of csr he had to go to international court of uh, justice at hague along with all the sanskrit um, uh, books and translated them into english to see that haldi was being used or is being used for thousands of years if somebody has injury eventually india won the patent and now csr has taken up a big lead in uh, uh, saving the traditional knowledge from piracy by preparing a laboratory by preparing a library tkdl traditional knowledge digital library so that we can save our uh, knowledge by, uh, from piracy by western western so i'm i'm who i hope and i'm sure that uh, the two speakers which we have today will throw some light and will contribute something to save our traditional knowledge and also to create new knowledge with these words i invite uh, our first speaker dr kasup kumar mathi please stand up and show your face um dr kaus mathi is from the csr national institute of interdisciplinary science um he is phd with a very close friend of mine who was to preside uh, the chair abhijit banerji i am a poor substitute for abhijit uh, banerji uh, he could not come because of uh, his illness um he was away to university of georgia for postdoc then singapore and had worked in some very good industries like sun pharma alembic and uh, now he is in nist and iist chemical science and technology division and he has many awards service excellence award from singapore bioimaging consortium csr technology award research his research interest is chemistry biology and nano science many students say at least 9 have been awarded phd with him and he has trained a large number of postdoc students he has about 100 research papers and i am very happy dr mathi you are having 14 patents and i hope you will save our knowledge from being taken away by others um with these words i invite uh, dr mathi to deliver his lecture thank you sir for your kind introduction uh, at the outset <coughs> i like to thank my sincere thank to professor vijay lakshmi sakshina general president for inviting me and professor banerji for choosing me one of the speaker in this session I, I, i'm sorry that you have time limit 20 20, 20. okay uh, so i just give you a glimpse of about uh, certain <laughs> molecules phytomolecules which we have made it as a anti cancer hits and one full story and few of the things before we start my presentations i like to tribute and dedicate this talk with late professor asima chatterjee and who is all of all the time our inspiring personality in the lead science of of natural products and all i don't need to describe anything so only thing i want to say that he she paved the way of women pursue organic chemistry and opened the world's eye in the power of medicinal plants so as the thrust of this today's uh, session about the natural product in healthcare and industry perspectives in the uh, sustainable development so if you go through the history in last 40 years these two gentlemen 
David Newman and the Kirk, they have consecutively published four reviews in Journal of Natural Products, first one 1997, then 2003, 2008, 2016, and last one, let, this is the latest one, 2000, uh, published in 2020. And they gave a glimpse of 39 years, what are the natural products come in the uh, FDA approved drugs. And here you can see that in 13 years, means 1991 to 2009 September, altogether around 100, 881 drugs are approved through this category. And they coined all these things, I think all of you know. Uh, among this, that is one is called the natural product derivatives, ND, which is now all are categorized in symbolic way, whatever developed in the natural products. This ND is well established. And most of the purview of this one, about this one, the synthetic drug, and which is uh, next is the natural product derivatives, which leads and my talk on uh, about one of the examples of the natural product derivatives which is coming up in a big way for the drug development. Apart from this, I am also going to talk about the cancer drugs. In 39 years, 181 cancer drugs are already approved clinically by FDA. And among this, you can also see that the most major share is the natural product derivatives. So this is the whole history. I like to say, especially in the students, Please go through this review. You can see and you can see what is the development coming up in last 39 years. So with this, uh, I just one more or introductory slides I am to, to share that the way of approach for the natural product to lead a drug molecules are the two. One is the unexplored area. You have the natural product core molecule which is find already the active and then Unexplored area means you make a semi-synthetic modifications and it gives different th clinically active areas which can be worked out and another is the broadly explored means you can increase in enhance its activity by semi-synthetic modifications. So these are the two approaches so far established in through these natural products and th these are all the examples are given all are well known. So all, and like that, you can see that the bracketing molecule, which is the core molecule from the lead or for the taxel, and this coming up, if you do the semi-centric modifications, you can arrive the docetaxel, which is around 15 to 20 times potent than the taxel itself. And if you like that, if you just one methylation in the chiral center, if you introduce it, that will give it semi-vastatin, which is m around 10 times potent than the parent one. So this is the beauty of natural product derivatives. And my talk today is one of the whole story which I will give you <coughs> on that. But among this, if you see that major share of the drugs which is coming up as a synthetic drugs are the heterocyclic codes. And these are the heterocyclic codes which is utilized as a most of the drug molecules, especially the synthetic drugs. Among these azoles are the coming up is huge way. And where these azoles are introduced, now, in the semi-synthetic modifications, this kind of azoles are introduced in the coarse synthetic or the natural product and give a more active pharmacophore or new chemical entities. With this, I am going to talk about one plant which is called the Hydnocarpa swartingula bluemi. It is called the globus fruit. Around, around 15 to 20 seeds are coming up and it is mostly used in the leprosy, is the seed oils and the ulcer and chronic diseases. So these are the uh, pharmacological profiles of this, this plant seeds, which is used mostly in this year. And these are, <coughs> these are the potent compounds are isolated from these molecules. So what we believe that, and this is one of the compounds which is uh, all uh, very much available in, in the southern part and mostly in the area of the, uh, uh, the Kerala and these regions. And, and we use these plants and to find out this, apart from these activities, what we can do in terms of anti-cancer hits. So these are the molecules. It is a flavonolignans or flavonoid codes. There are five major flavones that are isolated. Among these is the hydnocarpine, which is isolated in gram scales from that one. So our interest on that, how we can make it a potent hit molecules in the pipeline of the drug discovery. So what we did it, 
we use these molecules and make a heterocyclic core on it and find out the best activity on this one. The key strategies we have started yet, we have started in this work. Uh, one is the guanidium unit. Actually, for the cell penetration, this guanidium unit is very much essential, which is already proven by many literatures. So we have incorporated the guanidium unit in this hydrocarbon. And all this in vitro screening, we try to find out what is the primary level heat selection in these molecules and then detailed cell-based studies and as well as the uh, computational analysis also we have done to make it as a primary heat. So in this journey, these hypnocarpine molecules, we have introduced the heterocyclic code, isoxazole, and then guanidium unit and some of the linkers which can also giving a balance of the hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity to make it more drug-like molecules. So in this way, we have started from the isolation, characterization, and this make these molecules. And actually, in the literature, already we have published some of the dendrons, which is coming as the guanidium unit. It is called the 8GI, 8 guanidium unit molecules, which having highly potent in the cell penetrations, which and we have hooked on the drug, drug doxo, and we have find that this molecule carries or ferries the dox into the intercellular level and it releases in the lysosomal, it clips in the lysosomal pH and the drug will be resided to the lysosome and then it goes to the nucleus. That work we have published earlier. And with this, we have made a linker with this octaguanidium with the, with the, with the uh, hydrocarpine unit. And this synthesis is also quite challenging because it's the multi-steps and purifications all leading to these molecules. And Finally, we have do some of the in vitro assays, and we have checked the cytotoxicity in the uh, melanoma cancer cell lines, and then we found it's much better cytotoxicity or cytotoxic effect in terms of IC50 compared to that hydrocarpine as such, and that we further carried some of the in vitro cell line based assays in the apoptosis. Mostly, these are the common and standard way of doing this apoptotic evolution. The one is the morphological analysis by uh, this and uh, mostly the acridine orange and nuclear condensation DNA fragmentations that are coming out very well with this octaguanidium unit and another morphological units we have used to the tunnel assay propidium uh, iodide staining which gives the tunnel positivity comes on the most of the green fluorescence coming out which gives the most apoptotic cells out and finally we have checked this caspas expressions to know whether it is either intrinsic or extrinsic pathway the apoptosis is happening. So that also we have evaluated and anti-metastatic potential also evaluated through the wound healing. So with this first work, we have assessed a, a compound, hydnocarpine, which if you do the semi-synthetic modifications, it can give huge amount of cellular penetrability and make a, a very good anti-cancer hit. So in the next way, what we do that these hydrocarbene molecules, we have oxidized this primary, actually they, we have only one primary hydroxyl groups which can be functionalized. So we oxidize to aldehyde and that will do two strategies. One is the three plus two cycle additions to make the isoxazole codes and other is the multi-component reactions to isoxazole only. So we prepared a library of compounds with this, with different codes, core molecules on the uh, isoxazole core and we try to assess, and this is the isoxazolone core, where the three component, multi-component, uh, one part single uh, analysis, I mean synthesis is adopted here to make the isoxazolone, and we made this library of compounds. First things, just for analysis, we choose two cell lines, one is the melanoma and lung. And these are the data for the IC50 from the, uh, this is the melanoma and this is the lung cancer cell line and we compared with the normal cell lung fibroblast. And we see that among these four compounds having very good IC50 uh, in this series, uh, isoxazole series. And similarly in the isoxazolone series, we also find around four compounds which gives the very good IC50, which can be considered as a primary hit. And then what we did, we find out in the series there are four compounds and the isoxazolone of this another four compounds which can be can be considered for the primary heats. So what we did it, we do the in silico studies and finding 
with the, some of the protein codes on the melanoma and the lung where we use how the binding effect is coming out with these primary heat molecules and the docking scores giving very very good activity because these docking scores the values sometimes if reaches to the 10 or below above 10 it, it will be considered as a very good binding affinity. So what we did it the normalized way cytotoxicity and the docking score we normalized. How we did it the cytotoxicity which having the high IC50 Mo molecule we sc is scored is as a 1 and compared to 1 we have calculated the value in terms of the IC50 and the docking score which has been higher must docking score which considered a 1 and then we compared with this other way that is the normalized way. With this we find that these two molecules are having maximum value in compared to the IC50 and the docking score. So these two considered as a heat molecules which will be further carry forward in the in vitro studies. So we do also the molecular simulation studies which gives the stability of the molecules when not only binding it should have some stable time to reside in the binding pocket. So that also uh, analyzed through the mo uh, molecular dynamic simulations. Now what we did it after this assessment with these two molecules we do all the in vitro analysis uh, mostly the intercellular ROS generations which is uh, which we find that these two molecules even in one micromolar are uh, is quite good enough to stand alone for the other in vitro assays and then we have checked the apoptotic evaluations. All we know that this apoptotic evaluation we used to do all the apoptotic assays. So out of box we have thought about we will see the morphology of the cells through AFM. So if you see this the lung melanoma cells the morphology is looks like if the healthy cells but after treating these compounds, the, the morphology change happening in different way, but we have analyzed through the AFM. So that we have assessed and also other standard apoptotic assays we have conducted and we found substantially well these two compounds. And then anti-metastatic potentials of these two molecules we have checked through wound healing, invasion migration assays and the colony formation assays with two of these molecules which having substantial potential which we find out. So what we did it, we have a primary two heat molecules in <laughs> lung and melanoma as, as per this assessment which we obtained and then we have checked that the mitochondria mediated apoptosis which is very relevant through the JC1 assays. It is the ratio metric dyes all we know and we find that these two molecules ISO G and ISO 8 having high mitochondria potentials because the delta psi value will be decreased as this effect will be much, much higher that we have analyzed. And finally the uh, caspase evaluations also and the cell cycle assays also we can assess through these molecules and mostly it is forming in the G2M phase and the apoptotic evaluations we also find out the intrinsic pathway. So among uh, up to this it is a very normal way. Now we I, again we changed out of box another idea how this apoptosis happens. So we all know the uh, Raman spectroscopy. So what we did it here, actually there is one person, my major work on this Raman spectroscopy. So what we did here, uh, we tried to find out the Raman fingerprint of these two molecules. So what we exactly did it, these two heat molecules, we evaluated the Raman fingerprint, certain stretching frequency, and we have assessed that cellular internalizations, how it happens in the real time, that has been assessed these two molecules through the Raman fingerprint. So you can see this in the time codes, one hour, four hour and ten hour. You can see the in the around ten, four hours maximum molecules in the recited intercellular milieu. So we can see the fingerprint which is very, very strong. And this ACRS technique is a highly sensitive. You can even nanomolar, femtomolar, picomolar level, you can trace the molecules. So that we have checked internalizations and another Interesting things we have done it. It is that you know the cytochrome C release is happened from the mitochondria to cytoplasm during this apoptotic event. So the cytochrome release is evaluated first time in this work uh, through this Raman spectroscopy and in a time dependent way. There are three major pricks: 782, 1011, and 
14 things. These three peaks are closely related to the cytochrome 3 and which we have evaluated in time codes that is has been released. And also the DNA laddering experiment we used to do. We have replaced the DNA laddering experiment through the Ramon and where the phosphate backbone stretching, this can be disturbed or this can be breaked off and that can be tracked in this method. So that are the new evaluations we try to find out in this way and this cytochrome C quantifications can be justified with this Raman fingerprinting analysis. And finally, the pathway finding, now we are all used to do the dot blot assay, the apoptotic assays we have used uh, through dot blot. And with this dot blot assay, we have uh, make a plausible pathway for these two molecules uh, in this uh, uh, way, which is mostly the cytochrome C related and caspase 9, caspase 3 mediated apoptosis that we have made it for this ISO G and similarly the ISO 8 also we have uh, proposed the uh, pathway for these molecules. So finally, we concluded this work. This semi-synthetic modification gives a powerful tool to make them hit molecules through natural product, which come definitely to the clinical trials, but definitely requires the preclinical studies through the animal uh, and, and testings. With these two molecules are now ready for the preclinical studies. So which we are going to use it. And we published this work and two years before in the JMET came. Uh, I, can I do one minute? Yeah, I just, uh, apart from this, there are several anti-cancer hits, phytomolecules we have recently developed. Uh, one is the MLN, MLA arrives, and these are the seeds. This is the one of the key compounds or marker compound is found it. So what we do now, you know that is a combination of drugs we use this in pancreatic cancer. And there is a CMAT inhibitor which all we know. So we have synergistically, we have make a combinations between this embalin and the RP1. And we found that this compound is very, very potent using this ratio, one is to 4.1. And that we have incorporated in nano delivery systems. And with a biocompatible nano delivery systems, we made it through PEG. And that we have all in vitro models we have done. And it is much, much more effective, even alone on um, embalin and alone if you use the RPI. There are a few other works. This fianserin, that is one of the molecules, the benzo oil and uh, uh, isoglinin alkaloids, which also used in in vitro level in the cervical cancer. And there are certain data. The IC50 is coming around eight, but few more studies are also going on. So this is one of the primary heat we are are going to evolve very soon. And that is another molecule, nilotisin, so which also very uh, potent and hit in the cervical cancer as per the MTT we have obtained. And uh, this malabarican A, there are a lot of molecules A, uh, B, C, D, there are four major compounds. And this also tested in the uh, triple negative breast cancer. And that's also giving uh, substantially good molecules. And this is the rectogonda. Here one interesting thing we do, uh, you know this molecule in the germacron, we do the pyrolysis, the 3-3 three, three sigmatropic rearrangement and make a platinum complex. And that molecule is showing much, much better activity, even germacron and even we have compared with the auxiliary platin. So this is one coming up of uh, a next generation heat molecules. So this is again a power of the semi-synthetic modifications we must, we are going to evolve it. And the last is a, another molecule, it is called the casua fistula. This molecule is mo name is rain, and the this molecule is known as the gold, golden sour, and then uh, one of the uh, well-known flower in the uh, region of the Kerala. That also we have tested a very good potent anti-cancer effect, and it is having the anti uh, this wound healing act activity also we have found very much. So I'm going to stop here. I have many things to say in this line coming up this pipeline in the anti-cancer hit, but I'm going to close here. And before that, I would like to acknowledge uh, my mentor, uh, my guru, Professor Abhijit Banerjee, and, and my uh, current director, Dr. C. Anandaraman Krishnan. And these are my collaborators and uh, the industrial and, and the funding agencies, mostly all the work is funded by CSIR, DBT, ICMR, and DHR. Thank you for your uh, kind listening. And this is my group uh, having both biology and chemistry wing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we are from the God's own country. I welcome you all to visit Kerala. Thank you.
I thank you very much, and I hope with uh, your dedicated efforts, we will come out with some success. Yes, yes, sir. Now, are, are you collaborating with some agency for testing of the compounds? Yes, sir. Uh, we are uh, trying to collaborate with a few of the uh, uh, startups, uh, those who are doing this preclinical studies. And with this preclinical study, we plan to do approach ICMR for the clinical study. Well, we wish you the best. Thank you. हेलो नो क्वेश्चन ओके ओके पूछ लो नहीं कोई बात नहीं हाँ मैथी बिकॉज वी आर रनिंग शॉर्ट ऑफ टाइम डेट इज बाई वी आर नॉट अलाउंग डिस्कशन और क्वेश्चन आंसर बिकॉज आवर प्रोडिसेसर टुक अबाउट हाफ एन आवर मोर देन देट सो अवर नेक्स्ट स्पीकर इज प्रोफेसर नीरा राघव from uh, kurukshetra university she had her phd with a noted uh, biochemist uh, professor hari singh working in the field of uh, enzymes and she had done outstanding work as far as the enzymes are concerned at kurukshetra and we are very happy that she belongs to our department um, she had worked in different areas like uh, um, potential anti inflammatory agents anti alzheimers but i am happy she has recently shifted to drug delivery system and it is a upcoming field and um, her through with her efforts she has eight patents published in this area which is something very very unique and uh, she has large number of papers more than 100 she has produced large number of uh, phd students mphil students and is a member of the uh, professional bodies now i invite neera to come here. i request everyone to please be seated we have another speaker with us yes. Yes. a warm greetings to one and all present here in the hall the experienced persons who have been the guiding forces and always illuminating us always inspiring us my colleagues because we have to share our views our research on this platform and the budding scientists and the students i am very much thankful to professor vijay lakshmi general president for allowing professor avijit benerji to include my name at this platform because i belong to a state university and in state universities there are very less facilities for research so we are not able to do that amount of research but still what we can do we are doing it in my lecture i am going to uh, discuss not much about the details of the experiments but giving you an idea what we can do in limited sources of research because as a drug delivery system the in vivo studies are very much required but we what we did we devised some in vitro experiments in order to uh, design the in order to design the experiments in vitro to give an idea so that it can be pursued by those who are interested in the field so that we can collaborate with them and an in vivo system can be developed so it is just a preliminary study but we are able to publish four patents out of this work and let me tell you that this work is only a five years work we have done this in uh, we started it in 2017 and uh, as uh, the science says the challenges and opportunities the challenge emerged because our nmr went off in the department so there was very difficult to study synthetic studies to study the synthetic work that every we have to synthesize so many molecules so what to think of that at that time because students get registered 
they get a P, a JRF and uh, the most responsibility of state universities is that we have to train the manpower. We have to train the research scholars so that they can go to good institutes and work there. As uh, it was said in the inaugural session by the secretaries that state, the responsibility of the state universities is to generate good research manpower. So we are just doing that and it is just a preliminary study and I am greatly honored to, uh, I am greatly privileged and honored to be here to be in front of you because of the sustainable development and women empowerment. Though uh, my biological age seems to be much higher but my academic age started only in 2010 when I joined Kurukshetra University. So this work is more of only the five years work. So what we are going to study in this, what we are going to capture some glimpses on science for society as the uh, theme of the uh, this uh, session is the uh, sustainable development natural products in the healthcare system and a perspective from the sustainable development so natural products are the basis of sustainability we have to go we have to lead find lead molecules we have to f uh, pursue in the sustainable manner and of course, it is sustainability which is required and is the main focus of uh, world all around since 2015 that we have to uh, achieve the goals by 2030. In these seven years, eight years, we are talking about sustainability because this is the major uh, talk and it was not earlier existing. But now we always talk about sustainability in different conferences, but we have to pursue for that in labs, in life all around us. Wealth from waste. So this can be a startup also. If someone wants to get idea from here, the startups can also be there. As uh, uh, the focus of government, is on the data analysis and data generation for the traditional knowledge. So this um, the material is available here uh, for that also in the traditional knowledge and use of AI in the work. So as a bit of uh, every touch will be there in this presentation. But when we are talking about the medicine and when we are talking about the natural products, in healthcare, so we cannot forget the contribution of natural products in the development of modern medicinal chemistry. The modern medicinal chemistry is socially important, economically important, and lies at various interdisciplinary action uh, subjects. So, natural products not only have provided traditional medicinal system, but they have also provided the lead molecules. And what I am talking about will be the drug delivery systems of natural products. And when we are talking about the drug delivery systems, there are three different types of drug delivery systems, conventional, then uh, sustain, uh, sustained release drug delivery system, and why we want to pursue for the research that natural products should be explored for the development of the drugs delivery systems because they are biocompatible, they are easily affordable and they are less or they have no toxicity at all and obviously sustainability is related to that. Talking about natural products and not talking about Ayurveda. It will be, I will be failing in my duties if I don't comment on the, if you don't include Ayurveda, the last of the Atharva Veda, last of the Veda, it is the first medical literature available. And who gave this? The verses of, it is said that the verses of the Ayurveda are by the conscious of Lord Brahma himself. But it, transmit, it was transmitted to Dhanvantari, the lord of 
medicines and along with dhanvantari because of his contributions the dhanteras which we celebrate before diwali it is been mentioned as the national ayurveda day 2016 and we have various uh, literature available sushrut sanhita sushrut sanhita has been given by sushrut charak ashtang hridaya and bhav prakash nighantu is the uh, kalpana which has been traditional uh, traditional formulations for that and the turmeric has been the one of the main in component which has been lost talked about professor singh has also talked about the turmeric and this is the solid gold and curcumin is the molecule which is present in it it has been used in periodontitis antioxidant the literature is available on this molecule where they have been listed in various scientific journals so we cannot forget about warrior of haldi ghati as professor singh has said dr mashelkar he believed in the mantra of inclusive innovation that is more from less for more and stressed upon the need for the protection of the biopiracy in our herbal wealth the patent controversy as you all know is the haldi battle of india and where the us patent was granted in 1995 but because of the 32 the this uh, documents provided by dr mashelkar the patent was revoked in 1998 and the types of traditional medicinal medicines are which are in ayurvedic system it is swaras churan kwath churan asav and arishta ark avleha ghrata taila lepa malhara vati banaka bhasma and these which are used in the ents and what are the traditional drug delivery systems we talk about the medicine we talk about the natural products but we never talk about the drug delivery systems which are used in traditional medicinal system these are the fat which is used in tela and lepa and the fat which is ghrata alcohol which is used in asava and arishta sugar in the syrups milk that is the godugdh in it is unnoticed because we have uh, in normal drug uh, medicinal system we use this uh, drug delivery systems but the milk is the unnoticed which is to the modern scientific world out of these four last four are the oral drug delivery systems we are known about we know about the molecules which are uh, rasayans one of the very important branch of uh, ayurveda system that is the rasa shastra so curcumin is the belongs to rasa shastra but we are less aware about the bhashajya kalpana this is another pharmaceutical branch of uh, ayurveda where we are uh, focused on the processing of the molecules of the for the preparation of the drugs and in our work we used godugd gograt marich that is the black pepper and sharkara so these are the natural drug delivery systems which are available orally and the problem was that how we can develop the system in that manner we designed the experiment of we prepared the formulations and and trapped in the alginate beads studied their release studies and anti, their anti inflammatory and anti cathepsin activities were determined and what are anti cathepsins anti cathepsins are the next generation enzymes inhibitors which are related to the caspases involved in the apoptosis we uh, prepared alginate formulations along with the curcumin and uh, then uh, we prepared their uh, beads and the formulations were entrapped in the beads by calcination the beads were Uh, quite rigid so that we can study we developed this natural system to study the formulations then uh, this formulations varied with the milk uh, concentration fat concentration black pepper concentration at what we get we got different uh, we've studied 28 different formulations and in the 28 different formulations different uh, activities were obtained and this blue figure is of aspirin and we found that in vitro 
uh, inflammatory activities of this formulations were some of the uh, formulations were higher than the aspirin it was uh, a great uh, to know that uh, uh, the traditional medicinal system is having the what is have it is having it is having more potency than the standard anti inflammatory agent and uh, curcumin is uh, also known as uh, the failed missile by western world but it is basically the solid gold but it has to be used in synergism as uh, professor singh has said that synergistic activities are required and to take the extract we in our houses used milk fat and certain amount of uh, black pepper and also sugar for the flavor this work was published in uh, bioorganic chemistry and uh, then we uh, also found that milk is the nature's optimized delivery system and this is the work of some of the scientists available in uh, uh, it is uh, from 2017 onwards when you search for the literature around the world it is the only one report is there when milk has been considered as the emulsifying agent for the hydrophobic drugs it was in 1990 and then after 2015 this uh, compound this uh, nature's delivery optimized delivery system could get the attention of the scientists then uh, we started the sustained uh, uh, developed the sustained release drug delivery system by various natural products because uh, it is very much required in the conventional drugs we have way to incorporate different doses to maintain the therapeutic level but in the to uh, have the goal that it should be patient compliant so we need to have a sustained release drug delivery system so that the therapeutic value should rise uh, should be in only one dose or two dose so with this aim we studied various polysaccharide obviously these polysaccharides were nat natural and we developed sustained release drug delivery systems and target specific drug delivery systems in the sustained release drug delivery system this we will study later uh, in the coming slides Uh, one is the entrapment in hydrogel usually it is in usual practice that uh, entrap the drug in hydrogel so that it in after entering the biological system it may be it may release the drug at the different ph or at different ionic strengths and we also generated this and we prepared hydrogels and then we uh, studied the experiments in the uh, Uh, by entrapping uh, entrapping the molecules uh, this uh, formulations in alginate hydrogel this is the second paper which was published and uh, this is was again in the bioorganic chemistry then uh, uh, by various inclusion complexes we can uh, we have used for the inclusion complex uh, beta cyclodextrin which is the raw material after hydrolysis of the starch inside the body so it is biocompatible and we can uh, this uh, beta cyclodextrin is available commercially in three different forms but we selected the uh, beta uh, beta uh, cyclodextrin and alpha and uh, gamma are also there uh, curcumin was entrapped it was uh, formed in the in, as a inclusion complex and then the we studied its release rate there are various reports which suggest that that these are soluble Uh, the, by uh, forming inclusion complex, curcumin is made soluble. But what we studied, we studied that solubility is not the main problem. It is a problem, but it is not the main problem. When it gets entrapped in the uh, in in the cavity of the beta cyclodextrin, whether it is able to perform its action or not. So uh, we extended the work to study the sustained release system of these uh, beta cyclodextrin entrapped. Uh, Uh, which have uh, curcumin entrapped in it and we could publish it in uh, journal of molecular structure and we studied it uh, it's time dependent study time dependent kinetic studies with the help of uh, cathapsins with the help of protein binding studies with the help of uh, antioxidant studies the data i am not uh, providing because of the short of time so uh, the another method was uh, to modify with the surfac surfactant so the polysaccharides they can be modified we modified it uh, by and uh, making it an anion but uh, if uh, your uh, drug molecule is uh, different the cationic form can also be used by making them anion anionic we use the surf uh, cationic surfactants 
and uh, the cationic surfactants were used to bind the curcumin molecules. These curcumin molecules or uh, we also studied the various non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents also which were uh, uh, hydrophobic and uh, were not uh, able to perform their action and large amount of inflammatory agents have to be consumed orally and which have various side effects which affect the cell line uh, uh, stomach lining and uh, causing ulceration and uh, lesions so we uh, thought to develop the sustained release system so that the amount of drug that has been released will be able to act on the system so this uh, uh, then act as the sustained release system after, because hydrophobic binding is there with the drug and when it interacts with the receptor or with the enzyme then the drug is released in a sustained release manner. So th the synthesized support it is uh, free from the drug and uh, we have the surfactant what we used was the acetyl trimethyl ammonium bromide and the work for this anionic uh, the support has to be uh, converted into anionic form so those we use uh, took cellulose and with sulfuric acid treatment it was converted into sulfated form and uh, here comes the sustainability what we use in the uh, lab we took the uh, uh, citrus limata peels to extract the cellulose and it uh, Approximately 60% of the pure cellulose was obtained from uh, the wet uh, weight of the citrus limata. So this is how we can uh, uh, practice sub some amount of sustainability, uh, sustainability in our labs. Another work which we have done is uh, extracted the cellulose from, it was from uh, banana peels. The amount of cellulose was higher in banana peels and simultaneously as I said that wealth from waste. So this is a waste we can have uh, extract cellulose from here and uh, the extraction uh, procedure will be the same as from the plants and uh, the uh, this uh, it will be treat, uh, sodium hydroxide treatment will be there so the chemicals requirement will be the same but at the same time we can recycle the uh, waste material and simultaneously this recycling can also uh, we can simultaneously extract the bio ingredients like from banana peels we can have the serotonin precursor can be isolated from the citrus limata limonene and their compounds related compounds can also be isolated so this was published in a uh, journal of um, biological macromolecules where we have studied the various uh, sulfated forms but uh, I will uh, skip the slide because of the time constraint. Then we studied the various uh, surf surfactant chains. So the surfactant chain, after studying the surfactant chain, the binding efficiency was reduced. Longer chain was better than the shorter chain because the uh, shorter chain re resulted in reduced release time and reduced binding efficiency. The uh, work was again published in uh, Journal of uh, uh, biological macromolecules then we start uh, thought to change the sulfated form because there are so many side effects uh, uh, associated with the sulfated form the bacteria present in the intestine it leads to the inflammation so uh, why not change sulfate from to any other anionic form so we yes sir i'll complete it <laughs> So uh, we started uh, ph phosphorylation and another anion anionic medium was there but uh, its drug delivery capacity was to be ascertained. In the drug delivery capacity we found that it is produced in the higher yield and but it is easily processed because uh, the yield was higher and it was in aqueous medium in case of sulfuric acid uh, the raw material charred and the yield was only 30%. Similar binding and release rates were there and uh, the lesser side effects because phosphorylated, is, phosphorylated compounds are more compatible rather than the sulfated compounds. The, uh, it was published in Journal of Molecular Structure. Then uh, we had uh, these various supports were uh, started, uh, studied as the sustained release system for the curcumin and this was again published in uh, International Journal of Biological Macromolecules. Then we tried another anionic moiety where the beta cyclodextrin were uh, converted into carboxymethyl derivatives and again we used uh, acetyl bromide CTAB and uh, the journal of molecular structure uh, we published in that 
and all, uh, we also used AI in this uh, method because uh, var various drug formulation, uh, various uh, supports have to be synthesized in order to optimize the reaction conditions. So we used box bangen model optimization studies to synthesize uh, the support and then the study was further performed. Then we have uh, had the oral and targeted drug delivery system. In this case, this is a hell of a job because oral drug delivery system passed through extreme environment from extreme acidic environment to extreme basic environment and they cannot be localized. So uh, it is a continuous system, involuntary system, so with the, and it, the drug has to perform its action in uh, the specified time. So in gastric system, uh, the work has to be done in two hours from in, for small intestine from two to uh, uh, 18 hours and in large intestine more than that. From small intestine it can be targeted to the liver or it can be targeted to the large intestine. So intest uh, we developed intestine targeted drug, uh, uh, drug delivery systems where natural product is uh, combined with the linker and a polymer is formed where the drug is entrapped and the drug delivery system is prepared. Here we took the beta cyclodextrin and it was co-polymerized with the succinylated cyclodextrins and the curcumin was entrapped and we found that it is released not in the gastric system but only and only in intestine and the release system was for the 9 hours. That uh, the, uh, This got attention of our university and uh, we filed a patent and uh, with the Indian patent uh, this is the number of the patent. Then we tried to improve the study, then we have uh, carried out the cross-linking with the thalylated uh, beta-cyclodextrin. Again the curcumin was entrapped to study similar results and we found that it, is, uh, it can release up to 18 hours. So another uh, patent was uh, filed and has been published and this is the number of the patent. So this was intestine targeted delivery systems. Then we tried co covalently linked drugs. So covalently linked drugs, in this case we have a linker here. Yeah, we can see that this is the linker where the drug is uh, attached to the polymer with the linker. And uh, we thought that uh, uh, let us study its uh, targeting and we found that it is liver targeting. So we synthesized various curcumin esters, targeted drug delivery systems, showed their sustained release in liver and the curcumin drugs were, uh, polymer esters were synthesized and with the help of the esterases, we found the, in the in vitro studies that it could release curcumin only in the presence of liver esterases and the polymer was hydrolyzed as such and uh, we got the uh, with the support of uh, carboxymethyl cellulose support we found uh, we have filed, uh, published one uh, Indian patent and with the polyuronic acid where we used uh, alginate and the uh, pectin another natural product and another patent was published. So, we are also working in the area of anticathapsin agents and on anticathapsin agents also we have in collaboration published four patents with the, uh, in the de department of chemistry antitrypsin agents anti amylase and we are also working on the validation of the ayurvedic formulations and also the enzyme immobilizations for the industrial purposes specifically alpha amylase immobilization and that to, that to covalent immobilization is is being done and uh, we are also working in the field of biodegradable polymers with the uh, associates. My acknowledgments for Kurukshetra University as I am, it is my alma mater also. My teachers, Professor Espe Singh for always guiding and inspiring us to go ahead with our work, however small it is, however big it is, but he never, uh, he, he is our department ke energy stotra hai. We always wait for him when he comes to the department and we assemble there and for his guidance and uh, uh, my employer, Kurukshetra University and because of the change of policy of Kurukshetra University, we were able to file the patents. I am glad to announce uh, from this platform that uh, being a head of the department and uh, uh, in last six months, 26 patents were published from the university and 21 patents were from Department of Chemistry. So such initiatives must be taken at the uh, university platform because it will encourage the scientists uh, which are lacking in facilities to get their uh, work published.
so we are fortunate to work in the kurukshetra university and uh, dst uh, the, this uh, project was uh, sanctioned to me in 2009 and uh, only because of this project i was able to establish my lab work in anticathapsin agents and various jrfs uh, and csr fellow uh, srfs which was the in the form of fellowships i would like to uh, give a, a, a request from this podium if uh, someone can help us in this direction that the jrfs have been increased no doubt and it is uh, luring the research scholars but at least the contingency level should also be increased so with not not it should be increased at least my my proposal is that it should be at least 50000 per annum so that 1 lakh okay well, it, so it should be 1 lakh because the combined resolution can be said <laughs> well, uh, the we we are uh, giving 20 lakhs to a jrf and plus srf candidate but what a uh, what a the institution is getting uh, that is not a sufficient amount only 1 lakh in 5 years and that is very 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 small amount mm -hmm. and if we if uh, if people from uh, this uh, the platforms uh, secretary level they want that state university should contribute the uh, i would agree with him and uh, endorse his uh, proposal that it should be 1 lakh and if possible please enhance the contingency amount <laughs> so this is my research group uh, and my you can so one minute yes. Yes. and you can see that most of here uh, most of uh, the students are girl students so it is also women empowerment. women empowerment and except one the last one miss prabjot uh, all are married all have families despite that they have worked so hard and uh, so that the university can get and i have found that people say that no girls should not be there because do saal ke baad unko shaadi karni hoti hai then they go for the family way phir problems hain no if you are determined to guide them they are also uh, they will also respond sim in a similar manner i have a whole uh, battalion of girl students can be a king of gender by <laughs> no there are two students so this is my department and the uh, you can have kurukshetra darshan from here yeah, thank, you thank you so much sir thank you uh rishar jud there yeah very good one rishar patel okay uh let, because let we let it go on okay, okay so let it go last one, last slide Let it run. Yes, sir. Last, last. He is the sole energy source for us. So this man, this one? Uh, just a minute. Ah, uh ha! -huh. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Please. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I can only, we can only entertain one question. If anyone has any question, please. This is all Indian. This is all Indian. Okay. Because in-vivo studies are not there, so we are not able to get. If uh, anyone can volunteer for our studies, then it will be then we shall form the fraternity. We'll we'll talk. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. sure. <coughs> Now I request Honorable uh, Chairperson Dr. S. P. Singh to kindly felicitate our today's guest speaker with memento as a token of love and gratitude on behalf of 108. Indian Science Congress and Rashtrakuta Tukroji Maharaj Nagpur University I would like to call upon Dr Kostuk K Mehti so very good <laughs> very nice very nice thank you sir and thank now Uh, so if you can please stay on the stage only after that we'll have it and uh, professor neera raghav ma'am
I request Dr. Payal Thaure, ma'am, HOD, Postgraduate Teaching Department of Law, Rashtran Tukroji Maharaj, Nagpur University, to please come on stage. We'll have a pick and then propose a form. So, yes, yes. What are we going to suppose do? Uh, we'll have a group photo, sir, okay. and then we can propose. You come on the centre. No, no. Sir. May I please request Dr. Payal Thaure, ma'am, to propose a formal vote of thanks? A very good noon to all of you. I understand that we are running late of, for the time, but I have to do this uh, uh, genuine formality from on behalf of RTM Nagpur University and 108 Indian Science Congress. I express my heartfelt thanks to our today's chairperson, Dr. Singh sir, who has been kind enough to accept our invitation at the last moment and being the chair for this uh, session and successfully conducted the session. I also express my heartfelt thanks to Professor Dr. Kostub Malti and Professor Neera Raghavan, madam, for uh, letting us know about the importance of natural products and I agree with you all that nature is powerful what is required is to just uplift the veil and see with the curious eye what nature can do to us and I am sure that uh, with Professor Singh and Professor Malti and Professor Raghav around us this is going to be possible to have lot of drugs which are derived from natural products. I also extend my heartfelt thanks to all the respected dignitaries who have joined us for this session and all the delegates and all the participants. Thank you so much. The next session we are going to start right now. So I uh, request the comparer to start with the next session and I also urge the speakers of next session to kindly uh, maintain the time because Another session is going to start sharp at 2 o'clock in this particular hall only. So we need to give space to them as well. So we'll be having this session till 1.30 p.m. So we'll start. Thank you so much. Please be seated. A very good afternoon to all of you. I, Poona Mingole, Faculty of Law at Postgraduate Teaching Department of Law, RTMNU, RT extend a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of 108th Indian Science Congress and Rashtra Santa Tukroji Maharaj Nagpur University to the plenary session number 19 on vaccines, immunobiology and development. Before we proceed with the session, I would like to give few instructions to the participants. Kindly keep your cell phones on silent mode. Please be seated throughout the session. In case if you have any kind of queries regarding the session, it will be taken at the end of the session with the kind permission of the chairperson. For this session, it is a matter of pride and privilege to have Honorable Dr. Manoj Kumar Chakrabarti, sir, former ICMR Emeritus Scientist, as the chairperson. I request Honorable Chairperson to kindly grace the days. We welcome you, sir. I would like to introduce to you our today's esteemed chairperson, Dr. Manoj Kumar Chakrabarti was the General President of Indian Science Congress Association during 2018 and 19. Presently, he is Sir Ashutosh Mukherjee Fellow at ICMR NICED, Kolkata. He served as ICMR Emeritus Scientist and Director 
great scientist and director in charge of ICMR NICED. In his long association with ICMR as scientist in various capacities, Dr. Chakrabarti made several pivotal contributions. One of his work led to the development of a cheap and effic efficacious candidate vaccine against shigellosis, whose potential has been acknowledged globally. Dr. Chakrabarti's work on potassium channel is of therapeutic value. He has supervised several students for their PhD thesis. He did postdoctoral research at University of Kansas and also worked at University of Nagasaki as visiting scientist. He is a fellow of National Academy of Sciences, West Bengal Academy of Sciences, Indian Science Congress Association and the Physiological Society of India. He has published more than 100 original papers in the area of his research as well as book chapters, review articles and patents. We welcome you sir. Now I request Dr. Payal Thaure ma'am, head of the department, postgraduate teaching department of law to kindly welcome our today's chairperson with a memento and sovereign as a token of appreciation and gratitude. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, I would request the chairperson to kindly proceed with the session. Also, I would like to mention, considering the paucity of time to each speaker, will get 15 to 20 minutes. Over to you, sir. As we are short of time, I will not go into the details of the subject. Uh, so I will get, I will go straight to the, uh, straight to introduce the speakers. We have, we had originally, we had three speakers, but one of the speaker, Dr. Shanta Dotto, presently the director of National Institute of Cholera and, and Enteric Diseases, uh, could not come here due to her personal reasons. So we have two speakers in this session. One is uh, Professor Dhirendranath Katti uh, and another is Dr. Shumon Kanungo uh, from National Institute of Cholera and Enteric Diseases. And Professor Katti is from uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. So let me introduce first Professor Katti because he is our first speaker. Professor Katti received his B.Sc. in Chemistry from Ferguson College, Pune University in 1990. He did B.Sc. Tech in Chemical Engineering from the University Department of Chemical Technology Bombay University in 1993. Now the same department is now known as Institute of Chemical Technology. Professor Katti did his PhD in chemistry from Bombay University and he worked at CSIR Indian Institute of Chemical Technology Hyderabad. Dr. Katti was a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Chemical Engineering, Drexel University, Philadelphia from 1999 to 2001 and subsequently he became research assistant professor at the same department. Dr. Katti then moved on an assistant professor tenure track position at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and the Department of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Virginia. 
Dr. Kati returned to India in 2004. returned to India in 2004 as assistant professor at the Department of Biological Sciences and Bioengineering, Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. He is currently a chair professor and dean international relations at IIT Kanpur. His research interests are in the area of biomaterials, drug delivery systems, tissue engineering and nanobiotechnology. Dr. Katti serves on the editorial board of Journal of Biomedical Nanotechnology, Trends in Biomaterials and Artificial Organs, and International Journal of Nanomedicine. With these few words, I would request Professor Kati to deliver his talk. Professor Kati, please. You, you have half an hour. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> because then also we will finish uh, before 1.30. No well, thank you. Uh, Dr. Chakravarti for those very kind introduction and thank you all for, for being here um, to listen to my talk. And I thank uh, the organizers also for inviting and extending a warm invitation and welcome to uh, the university. So I will actually uh, be briefly talking about a, s a journey that we have taken. Um, I am not a vaccine technology person, as you heard my introduction, but I would like to uh, go over this small journey uh, that we took, uh, which turned out to be a very interesting journey. So let me start. So this is, I'm going to talk about a personal journey in the development of a vaccine, which turned out later on to be developed into a nano vaccine for a multi-drug resistant diarrhea or a diarrheal condition which is known as shigalosis. So give you a little background on, on this condition called shigalosis. As you can see there, so it's the leading cause of bacterial uh, diarrhea. Approximately 270 million cases and 210,000 cases de deaths annually. So it's a form of diarrhea but unfortunately it can also lead to death. It's called by, I mean, it's caused by a bacterial species called Shigella. It's a foodborne pathogen. It's highly contagious in that 10 bacteria are sufficient to cause the disease. Currently, there are four species, dysentery, flexionary, bordai, and sonai. Um, there are more than 50 serotypes of this bacteria. Symptoms, uh, is typically one to three days post injection, could be through food most often or water, contaminated water. You will get abdominal cramps, tenesmus, there could be blood in the stool and fever, vomiting, nausea and this could last typically for seven days, ten days and most adults would recover. Uh, but children under the age of five in particular they get adversely affected because they get dehydrated and they do they have blood loss the combination is lethal deadly so they normally die unless treated well in addition to these symptoms you can have complications this bacteria has a toxin known as shiga toxin and that is what causes multiple other complications and you can see them on the slide you know so this hemolytic uremic syndrome is something that it causes uh, it can cause rectal prolapse, can cause seizures, particularly in children, sepsis and death, of course, in neonates. There are also long-term effects. I don't know if any one of you know. You know, most of us, we think uh, diarrhea cannot have a long-term effect. But unfortunately here, 
there is a possibility of a long term effect if it is if it is uh, if the child is infected there can be stunted physical growth there can be reactive arthritis which are bad and vulnerable groups are particularly infants and the extremely old people these are the two age groups uh, which are ba badly affected and of course standard treatments for diarrheal conditions are the current treatments for this as well this is no separate condition so you have fluids and electrolytes and zinc tablets and antibiotics but unfortunately this multiple all of them the four species they have slowly over time gained resistance to these antibiotics and now they are all you have this uh, multi drug resistant strains that are floating around and i don't think you can see that map there it's sorry about that it's really too small here but you know as recent here in kerala we had as recent as 2020 we had a outbreak and typically when you have these outbreaks it can go to large numbers you know and all those you can see the spread of these little boxes each of them is an outbreak in different parts of the country in different times and when it outbreaks it can become it can go to the scale of an epidemic now of of late people are even you know because of what we had in terms of covid people even refer to shigella as a possible potential pandemic is there but uh, i don't want to scare you that much but it's it's outbreaks are possible so typically solutions are you know if you can get a vaccine that would be great and vaccines would normally be you know you could have either a heat killed organism which would be the actual organism as is or you can have a subunit vaccine wherein a part of the organism is you know used uh, to prime the immune system and therefore antibodies are produced and then if you have a memory then you know therefore if you get infected ever again you are protected and that would be good if we can get such a thing but unfortunately in spite of all the knowledge that we have in immunology and vaccine technology a commercial shigella vaccine is still not available part of the reason could be that you know it doesn't infect the developing world too much it's mostly you know developing or underdeveloped countries that are sort of affected more by it part of the reason could be that the other part of the reason is that you know the 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 this, this, the the bacteria itself has started developing this resistance so most there was a lot of focus on antibiotics you can see historically you know, a lot of focus on antibiotics most of them have been reasonably successful but over a period of time the organism develops resistance so you know it's it's a fairly unfortunate situation that we don't have a commercial vaccine so we need currently what's the requirement a highly immunogenic cross protective vaccine would be what, uh, the best thing to have immunogenicity should be high and then you should have cross protectivity between species you should have because you never know although flexinery is like the most shigella flexinery is the most common but dysentery is the most uh, dangerous lethal so therefore if you can have pro you know cross protection between all the species that would be great now cross protection typically would come about by conserved immunogenic proteins that means in all the species and all the serotypes it should be there conserved if it is conserved then if you have a target against that then yes you have a cross protective now what we decided to look at in that context was what is conserved in these species what we we found was that irrespective of the type of shigella they all infect using what is known as a type 3 injection system and what i'm showing you there is that injection system the bottom is the shigella and the top is the host cell and these are the cell membranes so now you can see this sort of a thing small pillar going upwards that is the type 3 injection system that shigella uses to infect its host and at the tip of this infect uh, type 3 injection system are three proteins invasion plasmid antigen they refer to them as ipa a b and c and these three proteins are responsible for enabling the entry of this bacteria into the host cell now thankfully this method of infecting the host is common across all species and serotypes so therefore it becomes a good potential uh, you know targeting molecule for us so we decided that we should take a look at this we decided to look at these ipa proteins now ipa proteins of course they are conserved 
and within them ipa b and c were found to be the most immunogenic in the presence of an adjuvant now further if you see ipa b showed independent vaccine efficacy this is reported in literature then ipa c has very limited reports and the primary reason was it is an unstable protein so obviously you need something that is stable because it has to be used for the purpose of uh, vaccination therefore conserved proteins that can target cross species would be the good vaccine candidate and however instability of this immunogenic protein ipac was the challenge b was already reported so just before i go further into what we generated as data quickly tell you the attributes of a good vaccine so in the interest of time i'll go little fast so you need something that is safe that is immunogenic that is protective against all shigella species and serotypes Uh, that would happen through a conserved protein and we looked at the conserved proteins ipa b c d should be cost effective in a country like ours can't have an expensive thing and amenable for mass immunization this is another important factor because we are not talking about very small populations we are talking about mass immunization now typically what works well for non mass immunization is either a non invasive methodology like an oral like we do for polio or an intranasal which can be self administered so I, if that is there then that is good because then you don't need trained personnel you don't need a clinician or doctor or nurse somebody at home also can just administer now within non invasive so we decided to look at non invasive because we could do that at home there are two things that can happen oral or nasal and we looked at both and i am going to present to you only today i am presenting only the intranasal part and so i'm giving you a small justification for the intranasal part it's it has better immune response there is no acidic environment remember oral you have to cross the stomach so the stomach has an acidic environment so you need to make something which is stable and goes crosses the acidic environment of the stomach whereas in the nasal environment there is no acidity then there is a thinner mucus layer in the gastrointestinal tract in the gut the mucus layer is thicker so you have to transcend that challenge in the nose there is not that challenge is not as much and the dosage can be minimized because the the network of blood vessels that are supplied in the nostril are pretty high so therefore the amount of dose that you need can also go down which means you could minimize the cost so therefore we thought um, nasal is also good and we are, i'm going to show you data so therefore now i'm i'm coming to the beginning of the actual data so to prepare for a potential outbreak and or epidemic i don't want to use the term pandemic conserved proteins of shigella dysentery 1 because dysentery is the most dangerous lethal of all of the serotypes so conserved proteins from dysentery could be explored for an anti nasal vaccine so now the candidates were as follows b c and d b and c have been found to be highly protective and b and c were found to be sufficient for for equivalent protection now since b and c were better and b has already independently been shown to be a candidate c was the only possibility that was left to see there but c was unstable and so the first thing that we had to look at was why c had a problem so chaperons are available that keep c stable in the in vivo system so these chaperons are what keep ipac stable if you detach the chaperon then the half life of ipac is very very short so ipac without the chaperon is unstable and ipac after removal when you do protein purification you have this urea purif i mean stage so therefore ipac after removal of urea aggregates at approximate concentration of 50 micrograms per ml so which means that at very low concentrations you're going to get aggregation of this protein and therefore it's not going to be effective for you so you wanted to have a proper separate so however the vaccine application demands that you have a disaggregated protein and stable so stable disaggregated protein can only be a good effective vaccine candidate so therefore there was an unmet need for an improved and effective procedure for ipac based vaccine production this we saw now so basically i have built the story to tell you that while it is a good candidate it was not possible because of its instability so now uh, previous literature that was there uh, you know for stabilization we found out now again little bit if you permit i would want to go a little fast 
because this is again talking about previous literature. Previous literature had shown that this chaperone, I mean, you know, this chaperone, if it is there, in it is stable. But when you take off the chaperone with, with when during the urea pur purification stage, you can keep the structure, but the structure is getting disturbed. So if you want to maintain the uh, that's a CD spectrum and the secondary structure, which is basically alpha helices, beta sheets, and then uh, random coils. If you want to maintain the secondary structure, which is critical for function, then you want to make sure that this protein is unperturbed. It remains, maintains its original structure. Now, LDAO, this molecule, LDAO, or lauryl dimethyl oxide, which is a zwitterionic detergent, uh, it was shown that it can increase the stability a little bit. And here I'm showing you uh, that it can go as, as long as maybe six days. You can go keep the protein stable for five, six days. On the sixth day, it starts degrading. So we thought we should explore LDO. You know, then for exploring this, we set out this journey. And this is our first hypothesis. Okay, now I'm telling you a big, uh, maybe seven, eight year story. Quickly, I will tell you in the next 15 minutes. So we hypothesize that introduction of LDAO in the purification protocol of recombinant SDA1, which is dysentery, which is the most lethal type. Because if it is from SD1, then it can possibly protect all others. So if you put LDAO at different levels of purification in during the different steps of purification, you might just be able to stabilize it and that could be a good thing for us to use it as a potential anti uh, antigen. So we did that and these are the objectives. So express the dysentery 1 protein, IPAC protein uh, without the chaperone, introduce LDAO and then assess its temporal stability. So now I'll go through the data. First thing we looked at was stabilization. So here we were able, first I'm showing you, uh, we expressed IPAC. It's a 42 kilodalton protein. So it was successfully expressed. It is present uh, and we could purify it as well. And till here, I think, is not a major challenge. After here, keeping it stable is the challenge. And I'm just showing you fast uh, here on the right hand side, if you can see, it is unstable and therefore it degrades and it's gone. So the, the, the proper signal that we were seeing here at 42 kilodalton, the, the band gradually disappears. And then uh, for, for a short while it is available and then it's gone. So what do we do next? So we looked at, on top I'm showing you the purification steps, the expression of purification steps. We looked at where LDO intervention will help. And then we found that if you use different concentrations at LDO at different stages, you can stabilize the protein. And so we did that and we found, now to cut a long story short, we found that we were able to stabilize and at particular concentration at a particular stage, we were able to get a good stable IPAC. Now, here what I'm showing you is the highlighting the portions and the highest concentration that we can get. So therefore, LDO increases solubility and yield of IPAC at 0.05%. It's a very small concentration. And remember, it's a zuterionic detergent. It's not some great rocket science or something. It's a very simple thing to do. So now then, uh, in the first process, we looked at at the stage of cell lysate. In the next process, we looked at at the stage of combining the lysate as well as the supernatant. And in the third step, we looked at in the purification step during only the supernatant. And all the steps now in the interest of time again, I will not get into the details, but I should show you the next slide, which is summarizing everything. So here I'm showing you three processes from the left to right process one, two, and three, which I just mentioned on the previous slide. And you, at the bottom, you can see the yield. The last line talks about the yield and process two gave us the highest yield, 37 milligrams. And the top blue numbers are the number of hours you need. So if you want to make it industrially viable, you want to also have this in consideration. So steps of production is what matter for, you know, scale up purposes. So therefore, high yield, less time is what an industry would look for, for protein expression. So that, therefore, we optimized this process and we sort of got, you know, in, in less than one day, which is 21 hours, we could get a reasonably high yield. And now if you do scale up, then you will get large quantities and they will be stable. 
So we characterized that, what, what we isolated, we showed that it is not aggregating because remember the literature was saying f f uh, 50 micrograms per ml, it starts aggregating. We showed that uh, if it is stabilized, it will not aggregate. And then I'm showing you there CD spectra at the bottom, the matching of the, the original and then the one that is produced at our end. And uh, lyophilized protein was also fine and it was available as, as in a uh, you know, multi-sized particle form. Then we wanted to look at temporal stability. See, one of the things in vaccine technology is you need a cold chain. You have to maintain cold chain. So if you can bring it to simple four degree refrigerator, the ones that we have at home, then that is the best because then you can reach a primary healthcare center and sort of administer the vaccine. If you need minus 20, minus 80, etc., then it's going to be tough. So therefore we looked at temporal stability. Now here I'm showing you multiple temperatures, top left minus 80, center minus 20, right hand side four degrees, bottom left is 25 degrees and bottom right is 37 degrees physiological temperature. And thankfully for us, it was stable at all temperatures, but of course the stability decreased as we went up. So four degree was very good. Above four degrees, 25 degrees, it was still stable. You can see there in the blue, 1.25 months, which in my opinion, we were super excited at this stage because nobody had shown IPAC to be stable for beyond five, six days. So we were thrilled at this stage. At 37 degrees, it starts degrading. So it degrades immediately. Although you see a band here, but you know, you can't see, it's a very faint band. It starts degrading within two days. So 25 degrees, which is decent temperature for India, most uh, parts of the country, you know, if it can be stabilized at 25 degrees for some time, that's good enough. So we thought we had, you know, sort of uh, circumvented the requirement of a cold chain as well. Then this is a summary of that. So if you see at lower temperatures, it's as long as 14 months. This is a huge thing. That means in tertiary care centers where minus 20, minus 80 refrigerators are available, you can just store it for long periods and then disbursement from there to primary health care centers can happen at a stage anywhere in these 14 months. And at a primary health care center, typically, if there is a four degree refrigerator, well and good. If not, at least 25 degrees, we sure that it can last for one month. So winter seasons, we don't worry about. We only worry about summer seasons then. So therefore, this was a good thing in terms of translation. Then uh, coming to the immunogenicity. So, okay, fine, we had the protein, we have stabilized it and it's temperature stable, etc. But is it actually working well? So then the first proof of concept, immunogenicity of this stabilized IPAC. So we, this is the protocol on the left. So we took Balpsi mice, we gave three doses, dose one on first day, dose two on 14th day and dose three on 28th day. And then we gave an intraperitoneal challenge on day 56. For shigellosis, this is a fairly well-established thing to give intraperitoneal challenge. Although it is uh, ingested through the oral route, but one can give an intraperitoneal challenge. And we terminated the study on the 70th day, 7-0. So, and uh, we used three doses of IPSC, the stabilized protein, 10 micrograms, 20 micrograms, and 30 micrograms, just to understand. And this protein, was the protein which was stored at four degrees in the normal uh, domestic refrigerator. So then, and uh, mind you, there was no adjuvant. It's just the antigen. There was nothing other than that. And then at the bottom, I'm showing you IgG and IgA data. Uh, the control here, this is the control one, which is coinciding with zero, okay, which is uh, just PBS. And then on top, what you're seeing, those three lines are the three doses. All of them gave a decent high dose on the 14th day and kept increasing as we went to the 28th and 45th day. And these are the concentrations of IL-6, IL-10 and IFN gamma. And uh, although these values are increasing with increase in dose, but even though you're seeing very low dose of IFN gamma at, at uh, 20 micrograms, that much dose is sufficient to enable or facilitate the process of immune activation and antibody production. So IPSC immunized CIRA recognized a heterogeneous species. I forgot to mention that on the left hand, on the right hand top is the data which is showing that what is derived from SD1 is also effective against flexinary or SF2A. Uh, so therefore it is a, it is a heterologous species. So it is recognized 
a heterologous species and resulted in significant antibody response at a, in, a, in a dose dependent manner. This is what we established. Then uh, protective efficacy upon Shigella challenge. So the first thing I want to show you is that the controls had got diarrhea. I don't know if it's visible from the back. There is diarrhea in these mice and the vaccinated one had no diarrhea. So the pellets were hard solid just as normal. Then the second thing I want to show is it's known, this condition is known as bloody diarrhea. So therefore, some of the mice also showed the bloody diarrhea. Then the third thing I'm showing you is, if you sacrifice these controls and take out their intestine and then culture that, then you get these colonies on the left hand side, green at the bottom, which means that these mice are badly infected. Whereas the vaccinated one, if you see within two, three days, if you take out their gut and then you do that, it's nil, zero. Uh, over a period of time, they would also develop some mild infection, but early time points, zero. Here I'm showing you uh, weight loss. Is the, it decreases with increase in dose of this, which is good. And then for flexionary, it's almost nil. I mean, you barely can see here. The bars are almost nil, so there is almost no weight loss. Weight loss is important because this within children, particularly when there is bloody diarrhea, there is a sudden drop in weight. And then survival, I'm showing you here. Uh, on the left hand uh, or right hand bottom, there are two. One is against a challenge of SD1, which is homologous, and the other one is against a challenge of SF2A, which is heterologous. And in both cases, you can see the vaccinated species. Uh, in SF2A, it was 100% survival, and in case of SD1, it was little lower, 70s and 80s, depending on dose. So therefore, IPAC, the free stabilized protein, showed cross protection in both sets. And, were, and they were protected from diarrhea and colonization and weight loss without any adjuvant. So this was our first set of data. Now, however, we wanted, we were interested in translation. And so therefore, you know, you need to have the maximum protection, reduced hospital visits and non-invasiveness are factors which are important for mass immunization. So we thought we should do something like a vaccine delivery system, which was using nanoparticles. So then, uh, we thought that we should minimize the requirement of a booster dose. Remember, we gave three doses. First day, 14th day, 28th day. We thought, is it possible to just give a single dose and manage that way? If it is, then that would be a better way to do it in terms of management. So we thought we should do a protective antigen against degradation and high payload delivery and adjuvant effect. We can see because, you know, there is this uh, degradable polymer called polylactide coglycolide. It is a degradable polymer but it also has adjuvenicity associated with it. So we thought we should use that system. So, and there are some other systems which have been reported for Shigella. I'm showing you two, but none for using uh, this polylactide coglycolide. So, and in those systems, they were getting some uh, improvement in survival around 50%. And I'll show you my data and you'll be uh, happy to see that data. So we thought we'll make a vaccine delivery system which will increase the possibility of, and it will become a single dose system. So hypothesis for this part of the work is that encapsulating the minimum protective dose of stabilized IPAC into a biodegradable nanoparticle and that could lead to cross protection. That would be the goal. And so we take the stabilized IPAC, we put it into a nanoparticle, and then we use this formulation as a drop in the nose an intranasal delivery to the mouse and then check for cross protection, heterologous protection. So we did that. I won't get into the objectives. The same thing I showed in the diagram. Now, so we made these nanoparticles, formulated them with the stabilized protein and we characterized the pro particles. They were small, around 200, 300 nanometer size. They had a charge of minus 25 electron volt and they could release the IPAC which was inside them. Now, we had to know what was the release kinetics because it is dependent on that. The antibody production is dependent on how much of this stabilized IPAC protein is coming out of these nanoparticles. So we saw that the, at the end of 28 days, we were able to get around 77% of the antigen come out, which was good. So therefore, uh, we did a degradation study and found that at 35 days, these nanoparticles are completely degraded. So you can see the morphology, roundish morphology keeps decreasing. And by the time you reach 35th day, everything is gone. So it's vanished, which means the whole particle has degraded and all the antigen has been delivered into the body. And this is the intranasal route. So we therefore 
you know, thought that these PLGA based nanoparticles may be a potential candidate. So the next thing we wanted to do is safety and immunogenicity using a single dose nano vaccine. So here, I am showing you here lysis buffer versus our nanoparticle. You can see that the LDH cytotoxicity is very low, which means it is reasonably safe. Here what we did, unlike the previous case where we gave three doses, here we gave a single dose. Single dose and directly, uh, 35 days it is supposed to degrade completely and then directly challenge at the 45th day and terminate on the seventh, uh, 70th day just as we did before. Only difference here what we did is we challenged at two time points. One is 45th day, another is 56th day. So we did both challenges and then I am showing you now the data for both. First, I am showing you cross protection, SD1 as well as F SF2. Then again, I am showing you these bottom two graphs that the control is in line with zero x-axis, whereas you can see the elevated levels of IgG as well as IgA for the nano vaccine and IL-6, IL-10, IFN gamma, all levels went up. So therefore, the nano vaccine, if you compare it to the three doses that we gave of the free antigen, a single dose with the minimum uh, dose that is 20 micrograms was working fine. Then we thought, okay, is this so? Therefore, it was comparable. You can see even not only comparable, it's slightly higher. You know, the nanoparticle is higher than the 20 micro, same equivalent dose given three times. So which means the nanoparticle is more effective. So then, and those are the quantified values. So then we thought we should look at this again. So here control on the left is diarrheal condition. These are pellets, no diarrhea for vaccinated mouse. Then if you look at the uh, weight loss, nothing. And then here, this is 16 hours post challenge. Uh, this is a movie which shows that the ones which are not vaccinated, they have a diarrheal condition and they are sluggish and can be easily picked up. You know, they don't move around much. Whereas now if you go to the next cage, the next cage shows the mouse which has been vaccinated. You see they are very far more agile, difficult to catch. So they are more healthy and more importantly, they have no diarrhea. So they do not have any diarrhea. So therefore, this is something that was quite um, desirable. And here if you see against cross protection, against flexinary, you will see the red line which is giving higher than 50% with a single dose is, is what it is showing now, survival is showing around greater than 50, around close to 60. So a single dose nano vaccine is, is possible to protect. It giving around 67, the accurate value is 67% survival. Now, further, going further, there's something known as biomimetic uh, nano vaccines. And here what we thought is, uh, we can get an increased TH1 response, T helper cell one response, which is responsible eventually for the antibody production using some biomimetic molecules and here we are looking at LPS which is present in most of the bacteria and CPG DNA which is again something which is so LPS activates it's a TLR4 agonist and uh, CPG DNA is a TLR9 agonist. Two minutes? Okay. So now we wanted to take advantage of these two and since there are only two more minutes I will go a little faster. So the surface presence has been reported in literature that if you have these on the surface of particles, they will facilitate entry. So then we said, okay, let's do that. So we hypothesized that we prepare to, in preparation for a potential outbreak, these PLG and nanoparticles can be coated with these desirable proteins. So we made three vaccine formulations. Now you can't see there, but there are three, nano vaccine one, two, and three, in which you have the nanoparticle with the IPAC inside and on the surface. Then you have a nanoparticle with the same, but you also have CPG DNA. And a third one, you have the nanoparticle with the CPG DNA with the LPS. So increasing the complexity of the nano vaccines. This is how they look, nano vaccine 1, 2 and 3. Now, I'll go fast to just show you the data. So purification I think I won't get into. We prepared the nanoparticles. You can see all our nanoparticles with good size, around 200-300 nanometer size, good charge and we were having the antigen encapsulated. Everything was fine as I showed you previously. This is just characterization data so I'm just rushing through it. But nonetheless, you be rest assured, nanoparticles are formulated well with the antigen in them. Then the uptake part, this was safe. We had two of these systems with and without the CPG DNA 
and here I am showing you intracellular uptake. You may not be able to see the central row, which is Tritsi, the red dye. And there on the right hand side is the bar graph showing the quantification, saying that the nanoparticle with the IPC on top entry was higher, the bar increases. And so therefore, cellular uptake can be increased. Then in the immunogenicity, here you see we went back to the three dose system. Again, IgG, IgA high values, cross protection across SD1 and SF2A for all the three formulations, reasonably decently high values of IC, I, IL6, 10 and IFN gamma. And for cross protection, we did again the weight loss and here importantly you have to look at the survival studies. So you can see there all the three formulations are doing well in terms of survival versus the free protein which is the violet line which is the lowest. And then this is an important part, last part, which is talking about are we getting passive protection? So we, we protected the parents, then we crossed them and we looked at the progeny. And when we looked at the progeny, we challenged with half the dose and lo and behold, interestingly, the progeny were protected. So that was very interesting to see the passive protection and here you can see survival, which was very high. It was more than 85% survival for the progeny. So therefore, overall, all the vaccines carry the potential to be effective. Everything that we developed, the, the pure protein, the single dose and all these multi N1, NV1, NV2, NV3, all are, are effective, cross protective against all species. And therefore, they pave for a way for in-depth studies to be obtained in a commercial vaccine. So we are very excited about all of this. And an overall summary, in part one, we stabilized an unstable IPAC protein, which has not been stabilized unto date. In part two, we formulated the stabilized protein and generated a nano vaccine, which works as a single dose nano vaccine and shows a protection of around 67%. In part three, we made a multi antigen, multi adjuvant formulation, NV1, 2 and 3, and all three are cross protective and effective. So therefore, overall, all three vaccine designs, these three, types have the potential to be uh, commercialized. Before closing, uh, I want to thank a few people. I want to thank our chairman here who was uh, introduced me to NICD and through him I collaborated with Professor Kole who is here at the bottom and helped us. And these two are the graduate students who did, I am showing you two PhDs worth of work in a short uh, 25 minute presentation. Uh, Namrata Barua who just graduated in October and Nadeem Hamad, who graduated in 2017. And I want to thank DBT, my funding agency, who funded this project consecutively, three projects they have funded. So thank you very much. And thank you all for your attention. Twenty-eight days. Twenty-eight days, seventy-seven percent. Loading capacity of in the PLJ nanoparticle. Yes. How much you load it? We have kept the loading constant because remember when we started with the free antigen, we looked at ten micrograms, twenty micrograms, and thirty micrograms. Mm -hmm. And through those initial studies, we determined that twenty micrograms was the minimum effective dose. So for the single formulation, single dose nano vaccine, we used the minimum effective dose, which was twenty micrograms. But mind you, twenty micrograms had to be given three times. But in the nano particle, we have put only twenty micrograms. So therefore, in spite of having one third of the total dose, it was giving an uh, effect which was even better than the triple. Yeah. Because nanoparticles have larger space. Large. No, the amount of antigen is only 20 micrograms. But nanoparticles have large space. Yes, agreed. But the antigen is one third quantity. The uh, question was about that, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, one more thing. When you conjugate this DNA in the surface, uh, it is a covalent conjugation or yes. uh, uh, how robust it is? How do you assess that uh, conjugation? So post uh, conjugation, uh. first we do washes and then we do a, a chemical analysis to make sure that it is because the bond that is formed 
between the CPG DNA and the uh, carboxyl group, which is a terminal functionality of the nanoparticle, that bond you can characterize using FTIR. So therefore, I didn't. I rushed through that data. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. But we characterized the formation of the bond. So if yeah. that bond exists, it means CPG DNA yeah. is covalently bonded to the nanoparticle. Yeah, that is true. That we also assessed. But one thing we also face the challenge. Such type of DNAs or any aptamers or any antibodies, if we conjugate in the nanoparticle surface, the question comes from the reviewers that uh, how much you load it in a single nanoparticle, how much in number uh, antibody or aptamer is there. So uh, we are doing many ways, but I don't know what is the exact way to assess that one. Professor, I would request you to discuss with him later on because we are short of time. So, uh, uh, thank you very Bye. much, Professor. Thank Kati. you, thank you all. And uh, I think uh, we are uh, always think of uh, this cocktail vaccine in diarrheal diseases because a lot of organisms are there which are causing diarrhea. So, I think that this is a subunit vaccine. So, it may help in developing a cocktail vaccine which may protect against shigellosis and some other organisms. Yeah, we'll, think we'll talk about that. Okay. Salmonella, E. coli, and shigella. We are thinking of that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So thank you for that idea. We are thinking about that. Thank you. So our next speaker is Dr. Shumon Kanungu. Dr. Shumon Kanungu is currently, he will talk on immune response to oral enteric vaccines. An overview. Dr. Shumon Kanongo is currently working as scientist E in the division of epidemiology at ICMR NICD Kolkata. He graduated in medicine from Calcutta National Medical College, did his training in internal medicine and epidemiology, trained in epidemiology from University of California at Los Angeles in 2005 and worked as consultant epidemiologist in NICED and research coordinator for International Vaccine Institute, Korea, and worked on cholera and typhoid disease burden and large-scale phase three vaccine trials in the community. Before that, Professor, uh, Dr. Shumon Kanungo worked in Chittaranjan National Cancer Institute in Kolkata in medical and radiation oncology. He joined ICMR NICD in 2008. He obtained PhD in 2015 from University of Calcutta. His area of work is public health, disease burden estimation, interventional studies, large-scale vaccine trials, health system strengthening uh, research. Dr. Kanungo's research primarily involves epidemiology, public health, and public health and implementation research pertaining to enteric diseases. I will not, I will not go into the details, so I would request Professor, uh, Dr. Kanungo to deliver his talk. So we, we will finish uh, within 25 minutes. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you for very much for thinking about me for this uh, uh, for this session, and uh, thank you organizers for inviting me for this talk. So I'll be talking on the immune response to oral enteric vaccines. It's an overview that I plan. Actually, uh, when we talk about enteric disease, Dr. Kati talked about Shigella. Shigella is one of the major enteric diseases. It's uh, caused by microorganisms, virus, bacteria, and parasites. And uh, typical are, uh, as uh, uh, we, we see I I the spectrum is called Vibrio cholerae, Salmonella, Campi, Shigella, Clostridium difficile, and different strains of E. coli. So basically, they present with diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, dehydrating pain, and muscle cramps. And like uh, it's like uh, if we talk about uh, typhoid, it's like uh, I mean a fever is another thing, and rotavirus it's basically uh, fever and uh, diarrhea. So why it is important? Why the enteric diseases are important? First of all, it's the burden. It has got a huge burden. 
2.9 million deaths per year, though it's an old data that I'm showing. Typhoid, cholera, ETEC, Shigella, and rotavirus complex, huge, huge amount of death as well. It is the uh, diarrhea may be as high as 6.2 episodes per child in developing countries in India. What I want to show you, I'm trying to build up this story to show, uh, to say that the LMICs, the low middle income countries are basically endemic for enteric disease and diarrhea, where the re response to uh, vaccines, uh, because the gut is not that clean, so the vaccines, um, uh, immune responses are different to compare to the, which a knife gut, that is the, uh, uh, the western guts, this is quite different. Let's see what it happens. So if we consider that these are the major pathogens, these are the, these are the only multicentric study that have been published so far by NICET and in, done in nine countries, the rotavirus, crypto, adenovirus, STEC, and Shigella, it has got different uh, in age group in under five years, it has got different the burden, uh, burden things. These are major five pathogens that has been found even in, in the enteric diseases. So uh, what are the risk factors that we all know that sub suboptimal access to safe drinking water, malnutrition, HIV, limited access to medical care, natural disaster, area of conclusion. That is, it's a LMIC, if in low middle income countries, but these are not the problem in the uh, say developing world, say in USA, Norway, Sweden, it, I mean the suboptimal um, access to safe drinking water is not at all an issue. What is that issue? Daycare centers where the lot of uh, lot of children or, or, or the adults stay together, crowding condition, travelers to endemic region, people coming from US to India, say military personnel serving in field conditions, aging, in, aging of the population which is a major population in the industrialized countries, mass production of food, natural disasters and area of conflict. A displacement like during the war or during the uh, flood uh, uh, or what happened in Haiti, though Haiti is not a, develop, a developed world but it happened it is a knife, knife country. Uh, so uh, the, when we talk about the prevention of enteric disease, I am coming to the uh, vaccine part that first and foremost is the improved uh, access to safe drinking water and sanitation. That is absolutely, others are no, 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 no. This one is the first one and using vaccine can accelerate the reduction in diarrheal disease and morbidity and mortality in LMICs. And at the same time, it is an adjunct, it is a, a short term remedy for adjunct to access to safe drinking water and solution. Available WHO approved enteric vaccines in India, what are the, let's see, cholera vaccine still it's not, I mean now the Shan call this wholesale oral killed vaccine has been withdrawn. Uh, uh, I mean the, and another is w, the wholesale recombinant B subunit vaccine which is WHO pre-qualified, which is given to the travelers, that is the oral cholera vaccines. The typhoid vaccines are, ty this is the conjugate vaccine and rota vaccines, these rotarix, these four vaccines are available, rotavac and rotasils are currently available in Indian market. So let us see what happens. All enteric disease, all diarrheal disease is basically seasonal. It has got a direct uh, relation with the chlorophyll concentration, sea surface temperature, rainfall. It happens in the, during the monsoon months. It is the same in the, uh, here in the Indian subcontinent, be it India, be it Bangladesh. So the, uh, let us uh, 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 take for example a model of cholera. It is a uh, enterotoxin, it contains enterotoxins, five binding subunits, one active subunit. It is a gram negative, facultative, anaerobe and com coma shaped. It has got two biotypes, classical and eltor and serotypes are inaba, ogaba and again for eltor, inaba and ogaba. It is endemic but it is also capable of causing severe epidemic. That is what happened in Haiti. It was not at all endemic but it caused, uh, 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 I mean centuries worst cholera epidemic in Haiti. Massive fluid replacement may needed for treatment. It is mainly the, the main stay is the dehydration to correct the dehydration. So it is a caused by poverty, lack of sanitation and clean water. Is a, there is, if there is no clean water, lack of sanitation, lack of access to treatment. It is a mucosal, it causes mucosal problem, it does not enter into the body, the cholera. Those most vulnerable can be provided with vaccine. So let us see the global cholera scenario, Where whatever we do in India, uh, I mean India there is a huge cholera burden, 23 countries reported cholera outbreaks in 2021, over 29 countries reported in 2022, as of 30th November 2022, 16 of these have been reported protracted outbreaks, these are going on. Uh, so in, in India, uh, I mean it is present throughout the throughout the country. It is a laboratory diagnosis with present with the acute watery diarrhea in the IDSP or Integrated Disease Surveillance Project. But still, it shows that this is a, a major issue. 
an incidence of 0 0.5 to 4 per thousand population per year. That means thousand out of thousand population, four as high as four people uh, suffer from diarrhea. So uh, and cholera. So it's an endemic. Now let's see what happens. Immunity against cholera. How does it occur? It's either an antitoxic immunity comes uh, that immune response to cholera toxins are less important for long-term protective, uh, long-term protective immunity, and antibacterial immunity. Antibacterial responses are more important for long-term protective immunity. That is a natural infection. The best correlator of protection against cholera is the serum vibrocellular uh, titer so far, which is not at all best, but still it is the best. Though vibrocellular was wane quickly, but protection continues. So let's see, management is basically replacement and eradication of Vibrio decreases and use of antibiotic which causes uh, less eradication of Vibrio and decreases duration of diarrhea. But in India as uh, most of the disease the report uh, uh, in the, it is hugely under reported. If you look at this, this is one data is showing the what is being done uh, in our um, infectious disease hospital in Kolkata which is much more than the reported uh, I mean 6 times 10 times under reporting is there in cholera. So let us uh, what we have found that it is uh, cholera is endemic in both uh, in the lower age group and the upper age group and the prevention uh, and who recommended cholera vaccination group to, group to target all age group then a vaccine delivery strategy then frequency of vaccination initial vaccination with two dose now the wholesale vaccine is basically two dose followed by vaccination every two years so obstacle is underestimate the global cholera burden overestimation of complexity of vaccine delivery and underestimation of potential benefit from vaccination so what is available what is the wholesale vaccine let's see this is the uh, uh, rbc uh, this is duke oral sbl uh, uh, and previous sweden which is not available in india this is for travelers this is internationally licensed Killed vaccine is available, uh, it was initially licensed in Vietnam, now licensed in India, WHO pre-qualified. Um, uh, this is the live, uh, I mean the oral cholera vaccine, wholesale killed which contains both, both the serogroups and all the biotypes. So uh, this is the, uh, it contains very high LPS, the immunity comes from the lipopolysaccharide or high LPS content. So uh, let us see how it happens. So this is the basic crux of serum vibrocidal assay that we, we what is done this decomplementing uh, serum added to 96 well plate and further serially diluted using normal saline vibrio cholera suspension adjusted at bacterial concentration or to 1 into 10 to the power 7 CFU per ml. Uh, so what happens with the oral cholera vaccine at 5 years is so 65 percent protection that means if it is given to 100, 100, sub, 100 uh, people or not given to 100 uh, people, 100 peop out of 100 cases, 65 will not get cholera in up to 5 years. That is the clinical efficacy. Now let us see how the immune response is. If you look at carefully the immune response, immune response wanes after 365 days. This is immune response is basically done through uh, vibrocellular titer. Vibrocellular wanes of after, after 1 year but the product clinical protection rolls up to 5 years. So uh, this is a typical thing. What, what happens, this same vaccine was when, uh, when uh, uh, tried in a low endemic country where there is no cholera, the basic vibrocidal, the baseline vibrocidal was very low. So the immune response was very high. That is evident from Sonla, uh, Vietnam, where the Viet, uh, where the vaccine uh, shows a better immune response. But in India, where there is a, a clinical or subclinical infection, our back, our gut is laden with bacteria. The immune response is much more slumped after second. So what happens that? And now what we did, 14 days after second dose. This is uh, this one. This one is in India, India on your left. And on your right, it is uh, uh, this is uh, on your uh, um, right is the Vietnam. So let's see what happens in Vietnam. Adults, the percent zero conversion was 90, uh, 90 percent. In, in Kolkata, it is 59 because the baseline titer of vibrocidal was much higher. And even in chil uh, children, the same thing uh, occurs. Baseline titers of Kolkata residents were higher than in Vietnam. Kolkata is endemic. Vietnam is not initially uh, the, among the subject with initial low vibrocidal titer. Rate of seroconversion similar to Vietnam was seen. 
So now what we understand for this uh, any immune response uh, of mucosal immune response, the initial the background noise is very important. If your uh, if your gut is very much uh, uh, I mean high um, bacterial content, it will show a very less immune response. But what we did after f there are two doses. After first dose, the response was much higher compared to the second dose. The booster effect uh, in an endemic area is much less. Uh, but in adults, where the, but in children, where the gut is much cleaner, where there is no bacteria, so the response is much higher. It is 87 percent compared to 60 percent in adults, it is 60 percent only after first dose. But in adults, it is 87 percent. But what we did, we tried to, uh, it is 14 days gap. Then we tried to do, we increase the gap, say let us 28 days, then the response goes up. So that the immune exhaustion becomes much less. So, though it show the clinical efficacy is 5 years, the vibrocidal response falls after 1 year. Then we tried, but with oral, uh, there is a live vaccine, the response is much higher with 65 percent. But what happens that in, an, um, in a public health live vaccine without testing the other immunosuppressing uh, um, uh, diseases, it is very difficult. Now, if we look at this, uh, this is a stochastic cholera transmission model that I want to show you. If compared, there is no vaccination. The cases is 11. Then the 14 percent vaccination, the cases come down to 2 point, uh, in vaccinated is 2.7, unvaccinated is 7. Na 38 percent vaccination, unvaccinated number of cases come down to 3.7. If it is 58 percent, the, it comes to 1.8. Now it's a real time. If you look at the number of uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, if you look, it is the number of cases that is occurring, and the number of uh, outbreak is much more slumped in case of uh, the vaccine, 58 percent vaccination compared to 0 percent vaccination. So this is the thing that we usually see. So when we boost boost with oral vaccine, there is uh, after five years it becomes a primary series because there is no boosting effect. When we uh, try to, uh, uh, so this is with the oral vaccine that we face. There is another one, another vaccine, oral vaccine that is I will talk about is the rota vaccine. Rota is basically is a segmental double-stranded RNA virus. It's a family is rota variety and is a major cause of diarrhea and detection rate is 15 percent. So this is the, again India in under five children, in under two children is a huge. This is the burden. It is one in thirteen. Uh, yeah, one in thirteen children suffers from rotavirus, and risk for uh, under age one in two fifty six is death. That is, event is almost hundred thousand deaths occurred in rotavirus. So these are the mainly two vaccines that is available. This is uh, this is two rota rotavac and rotasil vaccines are available. So let's see what happens with this one. The uh, rotavirus disease in U.S. declined markedly with the vaccination. As long as vaccine was not there, there was a huge death due to rotavirus, but it has come down with the vaccination. In India, let us see what happens. In India, in 2016, what it, 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 it initiated, 26 March, this is a typical success story, making India as well as believing in India's history that from 26 to 2019 phase 4 vaccination 12 million kids uh, started receiving the vaccine and there is a huge uh, vaccine effort uh, uh, vaccine effort ac happening across india so um, uh, vaccine how it fared in india rotavac it is the follow up uh, 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 efficacy was 53.6 in severe rotavirus diarrhea for rotacil it is 39.55 so, if we look at the seroconversion rate is 33.1, but in at Rotavac 5D where the liquid formulation it is 40 percent and the comparison it is uh, I mean prevention is 7.6. So, what we try to do we uh, immunogenesis rotavirus vaccine is also markedly decreased in case of compared to the developed world compared to the developing world, the immune response and the protective efficacy. Then what we tried to see is the, I mean there are two vaccines we tried to combine, uh, say first dose with this vaccine, second dose with another vaccine. And what we showed that this is the, uh, the efficacy has improved. The, with the combination, the efficacy has improved, the seroconversion rate has also improved. 
So this one from 2019, 53% coverage to year 2022 coverage, it went to 82%. So 100 days, this is the 100 days agenda that uh, government of India, this is the uh, through uh, has been taken by the uh, thing, the government expanded the rotavirus vaccine to all states and un union territories. So now, what I want to show you, this, uh, this is very important, that uh, rotavirus vaccination is less, cholera vaccination uh, effect is much more less in developing world, be the, because uh, in Finland and US it was 98% efficacy, but in Nicaragua, in low middle income countries, it is 46%. Why? We hypothesize that the tropical entropathy, which is the environmental entropathy, that the villi becomes much more, uh, it causes malabsorption syndrome. So micronutrients, uh, uh, this cause change in speci uh, specifically for OPV. OPV, we require oral polio vaccine, we require 10, 12 doses, but in developed world, there is no OPV, there is not much requirement. So, uh, in northern India, it has been shown that the OPV is less effective due to our gut. This is the biggest challenge with the oral vaccines. So, uh, and another issue is the breastfeeding and malnutrition has to be corrected. Comments and flora, use of probiotic, alter the local mucosal response and genetic predisposition may be a cause. So, so to conclude, the risk of diarrheal infection is present everywhere, but quantum of risk varies. Oral cholera vaccines have been found to be effective in reducing the disease burden in cholera endemic area since its inception. For rotavirus vaccine also, trials have shown the currently available oral vaccines. India can elicit immune response, but to a lesser extent from the developed world. Thank you. So I, I actually was interested in knowing, uh, since you're sort of an expert in conducting trials, what is the, the main challenge or two that you face in the conduct of trials for enteric diseases? Safety, then efficacy. Safety, 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 safety. Right, right. So for children, we have to take care of that first. For adult, loss to follow up is another issue. That uh, for any, now uh, is a hybrid design has come, adaptive uh, trial design has come. That immune response, the uh, you know, true immune response, which can be a correlate of protection, we can do that. But at the same time, we have to hybrid with surveillance. In surveillance, there may be loss to follow up. So something that, some very, very good work, sir. Thank you very much. developing the vaccines so in phase one probably the target is to uh, get some safety data and that data is extrapolated in the phase two also where the target is to find out the efficacy so the data is continued so this could be
in India, uh, the environment entropy and tropical entropy is caused by Now I request Honorable Dr. Manoj Chakrabarti sir to kindly felicitate our today's guest speaker Dr. Suman Kanungo and Professor Dhirendra Kati sir with a memento as a token of love and respect on behalf of Thank you, sir. I would like to request Dr. Payal Thavre, ma'am, head of the department. Thank you. 